Recording is in progress. Ladies and gentlemen around the world, we are back with you with another episode of Round the Fire with Momo. And we are doing the round two with Dr. Anthony Chafee. How are you doing, Dr. Chafee? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I am doing great. And thanks for accepting to come, uh, come on the podcast. And uh, since the last time that we had our interview, uh, so many things have changed and there are, you have started your own podcast. And yeah. from that, I learned that you are working on a book and that's great. Could you talk about them a yeah. little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I've, I've done interviews like, you know, with you yourself and other people um, periodically over the last few years. And I've always thought about doing my own YouTube channel, but I never really knew how to get started. And I think that's just the thing that, that people figure out is that, you know, you, you get started by just doing it and then you just learn along the way and you just, as long as you just get going, you'll be fine. And so that's what I did. I was uh, doing some debates with the Australian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine on a carnivore versus vegan diet. And I was on a panel of uh, six people, three on each side. And because of I was traveling at that time, coming back to Australia, and there were a lot of issues going on that I was asked to, to make a, a video and record it. So just in case I wasn't able to make the live debate, they could at least play, you know, my, my version, my, my recording. And so I figured like, well, you know, maybe if I'm doing a recording anyway, I might as well do one and, and then just put it on YouTube and just get going that way. And so I did that. And, and then I, you know, started doing like a little bit more and a little bit more and, and, you know, eventually just kind of got the knack of it and just started publishing a bit more and more. And so it's been uh, very interesting and, uh, you know, it's been very rewarding. And so, you know, these things that I've been talking about for a long time, now I'm actually able to get it out on a larger platform so that people can hear about it. And thankfully, you know, people have uh, received it well, which I've, which I've liked. And it's been very uh, nice to see that because obviously you never know how people are going to receive things. Um, I've been thinking about doing a, a book for you know, four years at least, and really just arguing that humans are carnivores, that we benefit from a carnivore diet, specifically uh, in the avoidance of plants and other plant toxins. These are going to benefit our life greatly by eliminating these, but further making the argument that essentially all of the chronic diseases, the so-called chronic diseases that we treat these days are not diseases in fact, but in fact, due to our diet, um, uh, you know, by different poisons and toxicities and malnutrition. So, you know, toxic buildup of species and appropriate diet and a lack of, uh, you know, enough species specific nutrition. So namely too many plants, not enough meat. And so I just make this argument and, you know, using, uh, you know, evidence in the scientific literature, uh, historical record, and also the practical outcomes of people using this to treat their ailments today and the absolutely stunning results that they have and just making that argument and hopefully getting that out to enough people so that they can, you know, take that and use that and benefit, you know, to benefit their own lives and, and reverse all these issues and, and maybe just never have them in the first place, which would be great. Yeah, since I had you on uh, my channel, you've become the star of my show, and you <laughs> have the eloquence and you talk in such a way that uh, you know it's very it's really impressive. And uh, he, there were so many things that I heard for the first time from you. Maybe I could have argued uh, with someone with similar reasonings, but the way you put it. I really love that. For example, uh, we discussed it on the previous podcast too, that you said, um, show me two animals from the same species mm -hmm. that have different diets. Yeah. I, I really love that message. And that's a kind of um, conversation and, and there were de debate and there. Uh, so, and about yeah, humans being carnivores, I also... I uh, heard from different people that we are hyper carnivores actually, and including you. And uh, what and the question I have is about the exact definition of being a hyper carnivore. Um, is it yeah. eating other carnivores or eating 
for example, 90% of our diet carnivore? Yeah, I, th I think the, the technical definition of a hyper carnivore is eating more than 70% of your caloric intake as, mm -hmm. as uh, eating meat. Um, I would think that a hyper carnivore would be just strictly meat, but you know, someone, someone came up with this definition and that's what they decided that it was. I don't know exactly who coined that. I don't know if that's, if there are other, uh, places where you'll find a different definition of that, but that's, that's the one that's, that's used commonly now is that you eat more than 70% of your calories from, from meat, but certainly humans have been more than a hyper carnivore. They've been pure carnivores for much, much, uh, you know, longer than, uh, you know, we, we give it credit for the, you know, the evidence for this is, is quite robust. You know, we have the, the stable isotope studies, which really just show exactly what these animals were eating from the, from, you know, sampling, uh, the, 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 the stable isotopes that, that exist in their bones and the fossils and finding that our ancestors that, you know, homo sapiens, early, earlier homo sapiens and other uh, human species, such as Neanderthal, that they had, they were, they had a higher carnivore rating than even other carnivores alive at the same time, like lions, hyenas, wolves, foxes as well. So, you know, that means that we were eating those carnivores as well. So that, that's, that's the definition of being an apex predator, being top of the food chain. I mean, you eat anything below you, you, you will eat any animal. Anything that comes that's dumb enough to get close to you, you know, you're going to take down. And we were very, very good at this. And, you know, we took down, you know, we, we made a lot of uh, species, hunted them to extinction probably. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, it was something that we were very, very successful at. And, you know, this was long before commercial fishing and, and farming hunting practices, people you know, were, you know, ravaging <laughs> these, these animal species because, you know, they were just so successful at hunting. So we've, we've been really the most successful species around. I, and I was, you know, uh, temporize that with, by saying, you know, except for maybe ants, because ants are just like, they've just in their own little realm of the world, they, they really are in charge. So they've, they've been very, very successful, but, you know, as far as, as far as the big animals are concerned, you know, we're, we're definitely it. And, and the reason being is that we were just able to hunt and eat basically anything, you know, in land or sea, you know, we take down whales. Like, I mean, who does that? We're this tiny little, you know, we're tiny little, you know, terrestrial mammal and we're taking down, you know, blue whales, you know, like that's crazy. And they used to do it with, with harpoons and not even modern technology. So, you know, we were very, very successful and the evidence shows that we were far more than 70% animal base, but, you know, we had some ability to eat some plants during times of starvation and extremity, you know, but that, that was during times of extremity, you know, we didn't need to do that all the time. And when we didn't need to do that, we didn't do that. And you know, we, we even see this in, in more modern societies where the, you know, people that are more poor and impoverished, they would tend to be eating more, more grains and plants to flesh out their meals. Whereas people that were more wealthy, they were eating meat, you know, meat was always the desired food. So this is, you know, it's only very recently that people have started arguing that meat isn't actually as healthy. Everyone's known uh, for a long time, just through, through personal results that, you know, this is, this is the most, uh, so, you know, the most beneficial nutrient. Yeah. And uh, something that you mentioned on your podcast about Inuits and the way that some uh, research pa papers are done, I, I think uh, either the people who are doing them or the people who are interpreting them and reflecting them, you cannot just blame it on ignorance. It is really criminal. Now, could you also talk yeah. about that Inuit re research and the re uh, conclusion they got from it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's the thing, you know, uh, uh, Mark Twain popularized the saying that, you know, there are three kinds of lies. There are lies, there are damn lies, and there are statistics. <laughs> and so, you know, you can, you can take statistics and sort of bend them around to make them look any way you want. They do this with a lot of different studies. And, and this is why you don't just listen to the conclusion of a study and don't, don't just listen to me reporting on a study, read the study. You know, and if someone's if someone's being 
you know, cagey with you about, you know, the study, then, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, worry about that, you know, that maybe that maybe they're making a straw man argument. Maybe they're saying, well, this is what the article said when in fact, maybe they said something a little different in the case of, of this. And I, you, you notice there's so many different things, so many different, I just, I don't trust a thing that gets published unless I like see, you know, the, the results and the methods and all that stuff. I don't, I, I never really bother with the conclusion. I make my own conclusions. And so in these Inuit studies, there, there are multiple studies done with the Inuit people, but there are ones that like the vegans or, or the people, the detractors of meat and the people that are the proponents of uh, cholesterol theory of uh, heart disease they'll say people say like, I mean, I remember looking as a kid, you know, the Inuits would be eating blubber, they'd be eating whale and seal blubber. And I remember like, isn't that what causes heart disease? Isn't that like giving them heart attacks? Like, I mean, are these guys getting a lot of heart attacks? They're not really fat. Like what's going on? I always question that. And, you know, the answer was they weren't, if they're eating that food, if they're eating that way, but when they're eating a Western diet, they're four times as likely to get heart disease and diabetes and cancer and, and obesity. So, you know, really, it really doesn't matter like what food they're eating. So the studies that are trying to say, no, well, actually the, the Inuits do get sick and they, they get a lot of heart disease and they have atherosclerosis and they get problems with their, you know, other, other markers. These look at the ethnic population of Inuits. So people that are living in cities, people that are living in a Western society, or, or just at least eating a Western diet and eating all the snacks and ruffles chips and drinking alcohol or, and even smoking, you know, this, this is not looking at the diet and the way of life. This is looking at that, you know, ethnic population, but not differentiating what they eat. So that's not really an honest study to then take that and say, Oh, look, you know, that means that meat is bad for you because some of these guys are eating meat and overall, some of them have heart disease. It's like, yeah, but only the ones that aren't exclusively eating meat had heart disease. So you're a liar, you know? So yeah, it is, it is misleading. And I think it's intentionally so. And a lot of these people, I mean, look at the, you know, the studies that happened in the sixties and seventies with Ansel Keys and, you know, various professors from, from Harvard and elsewhere, where we now know that they were paid off by the sugar companies to publish these fraudulent studies and to doctor up the data and, and make it look as if cholesterol was causing heart disease when it really was when it was really sugar. You know, and one of those, you know, uh, one of those Harvard guys was named head of the USDA and he authored and published the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol caused heart disease. Well, we know now that that was fraudulent. We know that he was paid off. We know from, from the actual data that they collected that it was the opposite. It was the opposite. Uh, actual results were opposite of that. So these guys it's, it's a documented matter of record. Now these guys were paid off and we know that they falsified their conclusions because, you know, they had data and uh, records showing the opposite of their conclusion. So we, so we know that they were lying, right. But they passed themselves off as reputable scientists. And, and indeed at one point they were, which is how they got into the be into the position of being bought off. But you know, this, this happens, unfortunately, you know, you know, scientists are people, professors are people, doctors are people, and, and some people are, are venal assholes, you know, and that's yeah. what these guys were, you know, and some of them are indeed uh, villains, for example. Yeah. And so case that you just mentioned, he's my favorite um, villain. I, I, I mm -hmm. personally believe that no one has killed as many people as he has. Probably. Um, yeah. 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 I look at the life of my uh, grandmother and uh, she was suffering from uh, diabetes as long as I remember and guess what she uh, suffered from Alzheimer's disease she mm -hmm. didn't have to suffer from that no, had it didn't. not been for all the dietary changes that came after Ansel Keys and there are several other people in my family who have uh, died as a result of diabetes and then Alzheimer's Mm -hmm. um, just recently and uh, had it not been for him this wouldn't have ever happened and this uh, shocking thing for me is that after our first interview I uh, tried to find this memo and um, it was even published in very mainstream in mainstream media 
I don't know. I can't figure out how these um, uh, pieces of evidence doesn't change anything. How, yeah. Well, how is that? Well, the thing is that they're not widely disseminated yet, so not everyone knows about it. Even though these have been published in the you know the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is one of the top medical journals in the world, and certainly in America, um, you know, not everyone reads it. And, and there's, there's such a weight of, of inertia behind this, that it's just this, this thing's moving forward. And because people thought that this was just settled, this was just the hardest science ever for decades now, you know, it really takes a long time to, to change people's mind when they're that, then that dead set. But, you know, I know a lot of doctors who just never bought the cholesterol theory of heart disease anyway. And so I talk to him now and be like, like, Oh yeah, that was all bullshit. I never bought that, you know? And so it's like, you know, and the, these are, you know, older doctors who just were like, yeah, I just don't know. Yeah, that's crap. And so that's good. And then, you know, and then younger people coming in, you know, it, it's hard because when you're, when you're first coming through and you don't actually know enough to realize how little, you know, and to know enough to realize how much of what you've been taught is actually wrong you know, you, you just buy into everything. And so, you know, most of the people that really talk trash uh, to me in the comments, uh, most people are actually really, really nice and really respectful and, and, you know, telling me about amazing reversals in their, in their health and condition. They're just literally miraculous, you know, that, that, that in the standards of medicine up to now would be considered miraculous. Be like, that's, that's just an outlier. That's just a freak occurrence, but it's every single time. So it's not a freak occurrence. It's not a, it's not a fluke, but the people that are like, you know, medical students or in undergrad, not all of them, but you know, the closed minded ones that really want to think that they're smarter than everyone else. You know, they, they go like, Oh my God, I can't believe this series or this, that, and the other, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, buddy, you haven't even gone through medical school yet. You don't even know the entire, I mean, you, you don't even know enough to know, you know, how wrong you are. You don't know enough to even be able to have the explanation, you know, talk to you. You don't, you don't even know that much yet, you know, but they're, you know, they're trying to argue these positions, you know, with, with someone who not only has graduated medical school, but has, has gone on since then and continue their you know, professional uh, training and also to treat patients in real life and actually see these results in real time. Now that's, you know, not, you know, the, the end all be all because I mean, how many doctors have come around and, and done the exact wrong thing and then passed on the exact wrong thing to other people. However, I mean, just, you know, have a bit of, you know, humility and think for a second, you know, like, okay, this guy has been doing this a lot longer than I have. This person, you know, may actually know something that I don't ask questions, you know, and that's totally, I've had a lot of people come in that way. And we have very, very good conversations, you know, and they say like, oh, you know, I'm sort of going through medical school and this, this really just goes against everything. Like, do you have any evidence of this? What, what is your evidence? What is your this? What is that? Great question. Here it is. You know, happy you asked, you know, and then they look at it and go, like, damn it. Like, we are not taught this. You know, I'm like, yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff you're not going to be taught. And so unfortunately, there are, there are influences. You know, medicine for the past however many decades has been really influenced for better or worse, probably for the worse by the pharmaceutical industry, uh, because these are, these are the incentives, the incentives of the pharmaceutical industry are to sell pharmaceuticals. Now you make a pharmaceutical that actually benefits people's lives. That's great. I'm all for it. But if you're making a pharmaceutical that just perpetuates a disease state and manages a disease state, but doesn't get rid of that disease state, well, okay. If it's, if it's just something you can't control and you can't get over then, well, you know what, that's better than nothing. But you know, if it's something that like, heart disease or diabetes, even, you know, many cancers and certainly autoimmune diseases and Alzheimer's, these things are caused by eating the wrong thing, period. So if you stop eating that thing, you don't have the problem anymore. So if you're taking in a poison, if you're eating or drinking water coming from lead pipes and you get lead poisoning, and then these, these, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies figure out a pill that, you know, can mitigate the effects of biochemically, just looking at this and we're like, oh, biochemically, what's this going on here? Okay, now we'll make this pill that mitigates these effects and helps you die slowly over 40 years. That's great. Or, or you just get rid of the damn lead pipes, 
you know, you don't have lead poisoning anymore. So right now we're in that model where we're just treating the lead poisoning by giving us something that, that modifies and mitigates the effect of lead poisoning on our bodies. When in fact, what we need to do is just get rid of the damn lead. And so the, you know, the, the drive and the incentive for these companies is to make that product that helps mitigate lead poisoning, not to then tell people go like, dude, just change your damn pipes. You know, that's not in their best interest. And so they're, it's not that they're necessarily trying to give you lead poisoning. It's just, they're, they're not even looking at that as an option, you know? So, you know, people like myself, I have nothing to gain from this. I have no, you know, vested monetary interest in, in any way, shape or form in this. So, you know, I don't, I don't have any incentives in one way or the other. So I'm just trying to look and see what's happening and, and how best to address it. I'm not trying to fix it with this product that I'm making. I'm just trying to see what the hell's going on. So it's just different, different incentives. And so, you know, because of that, you know, that's sort of the direction that medicine's medicine is taken because, you know, you're just, you're just prescribing things. Now, you know, you have this issue, we'll prescribe this thing. And that's really, you're, really what you're doing. You got drug reps that come in and say, Hey, here's this problem. Here's this drug that helps this problem. Oh, okay, great. Someone comes in, I can prescribe them that, you know, instead of actually trying to think about what's, what's the underlying condition. And so, you know, yeah. So, you know, going, going back to what you're saying, like it's, it's, um, it's hard to get this information out when you're working against this big tide of, of misinformation and agendas and incentives uh, and motivations. Yeah, incentives, to exactly. The same thing it is. So, but yeah, I mean, that, that's the hope though, is to, is to get, get this information out there and, and show the evidence of it. Cause it's, there's a lot of hard evidence of this. I mean, just quite simply the historical fact that these guys lied and made this stuff up. You know, that, that, that is a, that is a hard fact, you know? So, you know, it's, it's something that we just need to get out there and just get more people understanding. And, and I think that's growing. And, and, it, you know, at some point you're going to sort of hit critical mass and, and it's going to start getting exponential growth and everyone's going to be talking about it and telling people about it. And even now, you know, it's, it's being recognized. People saying all the different diets, oh, and there's this carnivore diet as well. So now, now people are even recognizing it by name in mainstream media and they're trying to dismiss it and say how crazy it is. But because they're doing that, it's bringing more attention to it. And, and, and they have to say it's crazy now because it is getting so much attention that they're going to have to try to do some words before they could just ignore it be like, oh, whatever, you know, no one's going to buy into that, you know? So I think eventually this will sort of, you know, having more conversations like these, talking to more people in our personal lives, showing the example of our good health. You know, I think that will, will slowly but surely get this out there. Until they cancel us because of spreading misinformation, yeah. even uh, carnivore becomes a misinformation and uh, we are accused of killing grandma and all. And yeah. by mainstream, I didn't uh, just mean a scientific journal uh, journals that are accepted by everyone um, mm. who is a scholar, who is an expert. Um, I meant that uh, I didn't just search because I uh, wanted to uh, listen to you and keep my focus. But if you search that memo, maybe Washington Post even comes up. By uh, mainstream media, I meant the popular media. It is mm. there. One of the problems is that that's what I can understand why that is the case that these things are not, this misinformation is not reverse, is that they publish this alongside a lot of other bullshit. And that's why it is dwarfed by that amount of bullshit that they also publish. Maybe that's one of the reasons. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, it should technically get people curious and hmm. yeah. yeah my hope yeah yeah well i was just going to say uh you're right because you know there, there's opposition you know there's sort of sort of op opposition uh publications that, that people do so you know all this stuff that came up with ansel keys and and various professors the reason that that the sugar companies bought these guys off is because there was research coming out and published papers being published to show that you know it was actually sugar that would, had a strong correlation with the rise in heart disease. And so they're like, oh, well, we need to cut that out. So it's, it's very uh, common for industry research to favor whatever industry is paying them. And so then you get out there and you say, okay, well, there's 30 papers that all came out and they all say that 
sugar has a strong correlation with heart disease. And then the sugar industries pump out 30 papers that show that it doesn't. And they, oh, well, what is it? Oh, there's 30 that say it doesn't, 30 say it doesn't. Oh, I guess we just don't know enough. I guess it's sort of equivocal. Like, mm, no, no, it's not. I, that, that's that's just, you know, garbage uh, papers. You know, it's just, it's just trying to muddy the waters to do exactly, exactly what you said. You just have all this chatter and background noise and static so that you can't actually see the clear signal. That's intentional. And these major food companies, you know, they have major money and they have major influence in the media sphere because first of all, they are the major, you know, you know, uh, uh, sponsors of these shows. So they're going to be putting in you know, billions of dollars in ad revenue in these things. So that you, you, you know, you can bet that they will have a lot of influence on what gets spoken about. And they say, Hey, you know, you better, you know, tell that line, like we'll pull our sponsorship of your show. If you say things that we don't like, and that happens, that happens all the time. You know, people pull, pull sponsor, you know, it's even part of, uh, you know, political, uh, in, you know, political fighting is, is trying to, you know, ha harass and threaten the advertisers for a certain media outlet or show or something. So you like, you better pull this guy, you know, you better stop supporting this guy or we're going to boycott your brand or something like that. So, you know, they have, they have a lot of influences. There's a lot going on there. So, you know, you can have, and, and a lot of these places, you know, have influence in media companies. They may just outright own them. You know, they have a lot of these places own a lot of different things, you know, so, so maybe this company that owns this media company also owns this, food distributing uh, sort of company it could be, but either way, just that ad, those ad dollars, those, those will actually push a lot of uh, airtime in their favor. One day I woke up to this message from one of uh, my family, family members that it was a study, quote unquote mm -hmm. study, that had proven that people who were on a vegetarian diet lived longer than mm -hmm. Uh, meat eaters even when controlled for smoking and stuff like that i was like well first of all i can tell you that it must be epidem epidemiological research without even reading it i can tell you that mm -hmm. and when i actually got to it it was even worse than that um, at first my cousin sent me the study that mm -hmm. actually it was a news headline it wasn't study right. and it was in persian and at the same day it was on the same day, it was published in English, and all the uh, quote-unquote reputable media had published it. And when I traced the link, I got to an article on Google Drive. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was just a presentation. It was not even published. Yeah. Oh. It was, I mean, there is so much criticism against peer review it has all um its yeah. shortcomings but it was uh, it hadn't even it, passed it wasn't that. that yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah mm -hmm. um yeah that's funny and yeah obviously it's, it's not true you know i mean epi epidemiological studies you know it went well controlled when well designed they can they can give you good information but they can never show causation they can never show you know, show the, the causative mechanisms that's going on it can just show correlation at, at the best of times and then you know, one of the one of the strongest things they can do is if, if it's well designed, if it's well uh, controlled uh, as, as best as you can with these things, you can maybe show that there isn't a correlation. And if you show that there is no correlation, that proves there is no causation, right? Because mm -hmm. you cannot have causation without correlation first. Yeah. And so that was the thing with these, these meta-analyses and these large uh, larger studies that have come out recently, actual studies actually published in uh, JAMA and uh, the uh, British Medical Journal and elsewhere, showing that there isn't even a correlation between LDL cholesterol, saturated fat, and heart disease. And in fact, it shows an inverse relationship with cardiac death and stroke. So it's, it's actually saturated fat and cholesterol are actually associated with longer life, longer, more light and longevity, better health outcomes, uh, staying independent uh, and not going to nursing care uh, in the elderly for longer and, and longer life and, and less cardiac death, less strokes. So it's literally doing the opposite of what we've been told for the last 40 years. And, and you know, like you said, it absolutely is tragic because you know, billions of people have been affected by these guidelines and they've, and they've listened to them. 
You know, people say, you know, I've, I've spoken to, you know, some doctors over the years. They say, oh yeah, you know, people, they just don't listen. They just don't listen. They just don't want to listen. So that's why they're having these health problems. And this person was, was quite overweight actually. And so it's just like, well, are you listening then? You know, and you're, you know, maybe people that live in glass houses, you know, shouldn't throw stones. And, you know, but I, but I, you know, said to, said to them, I was just like, well, actually the problem is they, they do listen. You know, they did listen. Things got worse, you know, because after 19, the 1977 USDA publication about cholesterol and heart disease, you know, in America, we reduced our fat intake by 30 percent, fat and cholesterol intake by 30 percent and, and reduced red meat intake by like you know, 30 to 35 percent. So we, we actually did listen, you know, and and as a result, the heart disease rate tripled. And this, and you know, the stroke rate tripled, the obesity rate tripled, you know, and, and like all these different diseases increased to such a significant degree, you know, that, that you, you can't actually blame fat and cholesterol for these things when as a population from the, the actual consumption data that you official government consumption data, we reduced fat, reduced red meat, and all these things increased dramatically. So, you know, you know, that's wrong. Right. So yeah, that, that, that is a problem. You know, people are actually listening to their doctors and <laughs> as a, as a result, they're getting very sick, unfortunately. So, you know, we just have to, we just have to work on, on, on doing that, you know, but, but people could just look at that. I mean, like people in the seventies and, you know, and, and even early eighties, they were, they were not, we did not have the obesity problem that we didn't have. And we did not have the, the autoimmune issues and heart disease issues. And people will say, well, maybe we did always have that. We just didn't notice it. And it's just like, you know, I don't know if you've met someone who was alive in the seventies, but they're not actually all retarded, you know? Yeah. So they, they can actually see what's in front of them. Hmm. And a lot of these doctors that are saying these things about, oh yeah, you know, yeah, we probably just didn't notice it. They were still doctors themselves in the sixties and seventies. Like, okay, so you're saying that you're an idiot and that you just didn't notice all this stuff going on right in front of you, well, then you should probably lose your license because that's ridiculous, right? Now you notice it and now you're seeing it, but you just, just never saw it before. Well, that means you were dropping the ball pretty severely. Dementia you know, is so, really hard to miss. Yeah, exactly. Auto, you know, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis is very hard to miss. You're in, in absolute agony and you are you know, shooting copious amounts of bloody diarrhea out of your body every day. This is not a fun experience. You're going to know about it. And as a doctor, you're going to hear about it because everyone's going to recognize that as a problem. Rheumatoid arthritis, hard to miss that one when people's hands are crumpled up and broken, mm -hmm. you know? So we, you know, we, we do treat these things. We've known about them for a very long time. Some of these things, centuries or millennia. So they've been on the books, you know, and some of these diseases like heart disease, very recently that we came across it, but people have been doing autopsies and, and cadaver dissections, you know, really to a, to a high extent since the Renaissance, because the church opened up, basically there was, there was a, you know, you couldn't, couldn't cut up bodies because they thought that this was you know, desecrating a body. And so they're like, yeah, you know, can't, can't do that. And then at the Renaissance, they, they made allowances for, for the artists like Da Vinci and Michelangelo to do cadaver dissections so that they could understand anatomy more and so that they can make more realistic art. And so this is why people like, you know, Michelangelo and Leonardo had some brilliant, brilliant works of art, but they were also brilliant, brilliant scientists and anatomists. And that's what lent itself uh, to being you know, brilliant, brilliant artists because they knew what the body looked like. They knew where muscles went in this area. There's, there's a, there's a great example of, of a statue um, that Michelangelo did. And this guy has his, his pinky up like this, like that. And you see his muscle on my arm. You see uh -huh. there, right yeah. there. Just sort of flexes right there. Uh -huh. That muscle only does that if, you're, if your little finger is extended. Wow. And he had this statue was going like this and that muscle is tensed. Wow. That guy knew the hell out of the body. So you think that that guy is just going to be too stupid and blind to notice, you know, blocked arteries in the, in the heart, just not going to get that. Just not going to notice with go, oh, you know, or all the people that came after him doing millions of dissections over the centuries, really, they're just, just never going to notice it. You know, 
you make your name as a doctor by describing new pathologies and, and you get your name written after. This is why we have Trendelenburg gait and a Collie's fracture and, you know, and, uh, you know, Osler's notes. These are things that people discovered that were different and people were like, you know, I'm going to stamp my name on that. You know, so heart disease is something that actually has, was only started to be noticed much more recently than that, just in the, in the 20th century, really. And, you know, and, and that just doesn't make sense. And if this was happening in such great numbers before that, that no one would have picked that up. Another thing apart from doing studies is, I mean, for someone who wasn't very familiar with unscientific studies, when I started my journey, is simply experience when I had my and when I experienced mental clarity on keto uh, on a ketogenic diet first then I knew for a fact that all the things that we've been told might be a lie I, I realized that I am eating more fat I am eating more meat and now everything's sharp. Uh, I feel better. Mm -hmm. I can, I don't have to drink coffee to go through my classes and I don't get sleepy in my classes. So this shouldn't be harmful. And uh, life experience, maybe there, there are, it is very good proof that something is working. It is not that scientific, but when you do experience that, no amount of quote unquote scientific data can, can reverse that. Yeah. Well, that, that's the thing, you know, I mean, people say it's just like, well, you know, that's just anecdotal. So it doesn't matter. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess it didn't happen then, you know, like you, know, <laughs> you, you, you experience, you know, much better mental clarity and health. And so many people have reversed very serious ailments that cost tens of thousands of dollars to treat and, and they just go away. And so like, yeah, 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 whatever. That's just anecdotal. Well, you know what? Anecdotal or no, it still happened. And that, and that happened to that person. So it's, uh, it's still significant. And when you are healing people and you are getting them better and it's person after person, after person, after person, after person, it's all getting the exact same results with the exact same uh, treatment or you know, changes to their lifestyle. You know, yeah, you really should start to, paying attention that, you know, Harvard came out with a uh, study, you know, it was, it was a survey study, epidemiological study, but, you know, it was, it was well-made and they found that, you know, basically everyone improved in some fashion. And some of these people improved in dramatic ways, you know, reverse their autoimmune issues, reverse their diabetes, reverse their heart disease, and, you know, had made very, very serious, had very, very serious benefits uh, to their, to their health and lifestyle. So, you know, there's other, other studies too. I mean, I mean, just the simple fact that, that, uh, Hong Kong has the you know, longest average life expectancy, life expectancies from birth aren't, uh, great because you can look at like, you know, people say, Oh, all oh, the Maasai, you know, they just eat meat and they have a low life expectancy. And so it's like, yeah, average from birth is a very different thing than how old are people living before they die of old age. You know, when you're living out in the savanna and you're fighting lions with sticks to keep them away from your cattle, you know, you, you may have a harder life than some jackass sitting in the desk in Silicon Valley, you know, and so you can get killed without actually being unhealthy. And when, you know, in, in a lot of these, um, you, know, and, and, you know, even in, in the 1800s or even early 1900s in the West, you know, something like three out of five children were dying in infancy in, in the 1800s in America. So, you know, when you have that low of an average uh, of, of infant uh, survival, you know, that's going to pull that, that average down significantly. So obviously you're not going to have a huge average life expectancy from birth, but when, but these statistics actually, the, the people that take these statistics aren't actually as dumb as the people who read them because, you know, we have census data looking at the average life expectancy since literally 1850, I've got it on my phone, you know, and it's like, you can look at every year, it goes by 10 year increments uh, for, for the older times. And, uh, you know, from birth, the average life expectancy is, is 36. But if you make it to 10 years old, it's 56, you know? So like it, that already right there is, is just showing you that this is not talking about people dying of old age at 36. It's talking about people dying because they're being killed by something. That's a very different thing. So, 
average life expectancy from birth in Hong Kong is the highest on earth. It's around 80, I think it's 80.2 years. And they also eat the most meat per capita in the world, about 1.5 pounds of meat per person a year or per person per day. So, you know, obviously, you know, infants and children and even, you know, most, you know, women maybe won't be eating as much as like an adult man. Right. So that means that some of these guys are eating, you know, two mm. pounds of meat or, or more, you know, just to bring that average up. So they're eating the most meat and they're having the, the highest life expectancy. And there was a study that just came out recently that looked at 175 different countries, controlled for a lot of different factors. It was a very, very well designed study and very in depth look. And they found that the more meat you ate, the longer you lived, pure and simple. And you had less disease, you had less problems, you had less health related issues. So the more, and, and this is also uh, indicated you know, having animal protein, animal based um, protein is, is uh, indicated in, in higher IQs and better results with uh, in, in scholastic endeavors. So there's like in different third world countries, they found that just, just providing kids one extra egg a day significantly improved their uh, brain development and their success in school. So one egg, one egg a day, that was it. That was that, that made such a big difference, but because this was valuable, this cost money. So maybe they were raising chickens for eggs, but they were selling these eggs because they're very poor. And then they were buying mm -hmm. cheaper things like you know rice or whatever. And they were eating that. And just, just keeping back one egg a day for these kids actually made, made a massive, massive difference. So when people talk about, oh, we're eating too much protein. No, we're not eating enough protein. Around the world, we are, we are severely protein deficient. And this is something that uh, Dr. Peter Ballerstedt, um, who I really, I, I just think he's great. I, I think he has, has such good information, such, just such hard facts about these sorts of things that, that really are insightful. He talks a lot about this in his, in his videos and his talks. And we, we talk about that. And when I've interviewed him on my podcast, the guy's super, super interesting. And so I encourage that, you know, everyone to take a look at, uh, at his stuff because, you know, he's just, he's just showing how important animal based nutrition is for people. And that it's actually, it's actually vital for the health of the environment as well. People don't realize that, but that's, it's animals that recycle the nutrients that, that are found in sort of dead vegetation. They eat down the dead plants and they, you know, you know, urinate and defecate. And that is actually what returns those nutrients down to the ground. People say, oh, it takes so much water to raise a cow. Like, no, it doesn't. It actually doesn't take any because you're talking, but because they calculate yeah. the rainfall on the grass and them eating the grass, they count that as water usage. Okay. That's dumb, but they also look at, you know, how much water a cow drinks. Okay. Does that just disappear? There's just no more water now, or do they pee that out on the grass and then like hydrate and nourish the grass? I mean, I mean, just if you, if you literally think for just one second, you'll just see so many holes in these arguments and he, and he just gives, and he thinks for many more seconds than that. And he shows very, very hard, conclusive evidence, uh, to the effect that eating animal-based nutrition is extremely vital for human, uh, survival and, and human thriving, but also for the survival of, of the environment and the thriving nature of the environment as well. That's a problem of, uh, linear thinking. When you think that that animal drinks that water and where does it go? If it just disappears, yeah. it just disappears. A cow would have been uh, a thousand times as big as what a normal cow is, mm -hmm. if that water didn't go anywhere. And it's important to ask, where does that yeah. water go? And, and and then it would pop and we'd get the water back. You know, I mean like <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, you know, even that's you know, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, matter is conserved. This is a this is a physical law of the universe. You know, it cannot be created or destroyed. Like sorry, you know. True. And see, um, maybe it is better that we start with the protein because and protein because that's uh, something that I have less material on. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to the importance of protein and the myths about overconsumption of protein more? Well, the, the main, the main myth about protein consumption is that it's going to harm your kidneys. Some people say it harms your liver. I mean, there's really no evidence for that. Uh, there's no evidence for it harming your kidneys either. It's just a supposition. So there's a lot of things in medicine that I've learned since 
exploring things on my own and looking through literature on my own that are literally just based in, in no science and not, not even any, any actual real study or evidence or, or even, even physiological, uh, you know, you know, sort of uh, thought process. It was just like, it was just like, you sort of think about it and then just be like, oh yeah, that kind of sounds right. We don't really know one way or the other. So let's just pretend it's this way until we know better. But the problem is, is that they just keep perpetuating that, perpetuating that. And when things are just repeated a certain number of times, we'll just believe that as fact. They believe it as truth. And so that's what happened with protein. They said that, oh, if you eat protein, you'll cleave off this nitrogen group. That nitrogen gets turned into ammonia, which then gets turned into urea. And then you have to excrete that urea uh, through your kidneys. And, and we look at urea levels as like, you know, one of the markers of kidney function. We also look at creatinine. That's, that's really what we look at. But if your urea is up, we think Ooh, something's wrong. Uh, but no, not really, because your urea is uh, actually one of your body's strongest anti-inflammatories. So actually having more of that, you know, isn't necessarily a bad thing if it's physiological, if your body is doing that on its own. When you're sick, this is sometimes can be a marker of inflammation. You know, if someone has a bad pneumonia and you look at the urea, if it's above a certain amount, you say like that person's really sick. Okay. Well, is that because their kidneys are shutting down or is that because their body's trying to mount a response to fight this infection? Probably the latter. When, you know, we actually looked at this and looked at studies and studied this, you know, we actually found the opposite. Actually, there were, there were uh, studies that, that showed that in fact, the more protein you ate, the better kidney function you had, right? So this is basically, there's always think about things at first principle, just, just drop it down to as, 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 as base of a level as we can. What do we do when we're eating? What are we trying to achieve when we're eating? We are trying to give our bodies the building blocks necessary to build and maintain meat. We are meat. You are what you eat. Okay. So why aren't we eating meat? Okay. We need the building blocks to make meat. Meat has everything you need flat out, plain and simple. You know, it's like, Oh, meat's going to have like different things are carcinogenic. Like that is, that's going to, that's going to, that's had something in it that's carcinogenic. That's just going to cause cancer just because it's in my body. Probably not. So, you know, that, that, that's just, you know, it doesn't pass the smell test to say that this, these things have all these toxins and poisons. And it's like, well, that means that we're riddled with toxins and poisons. Are we though? You know, like, you know, not, not in the inherent nature of our own bodies. That doesn't make any damn sense. So <clears throat> we are, we have been vilifying meat. We've certainly been vilifying fat cholesterol, which is absolutely baseless. And we know, obviously we mentioned that, that this was fraudulent, <clears throat> but cholesterol is actually, you know, one of one of the most important molecules in your body is ubiquitous. It's, it's used in almost everything. Your brain's made out of it. Your body, every single cell in your body is made out of cholesterol. Your cell membranes in your body are all cholesterol. I remember learning that in eighth grade and looking at it in the textbook only like, but isn't cholesterol bad? Like, how can it be bad if we were made of cholesterol? And I was like, well, there's probably something else I don't know yet. So I just, I just put it to the side, but you know, I still remember that. I still remember thinking that going like, that's weird. So cholesterol is also the precursor to most of our hormones, you know, our testosterone, estrogen, progestogens, um, our mineralocorticoids, our glucocorticoids, you know, these things are very, very important, right? So, so, you know, cortisol, right? So that's a very important uh, molecule in our body. You know, that, that precursor of that is cholesterol. We don't have enough cholesterol. We're not going to have enough cortisol. We're not going to have enough testosterone. We're not going to have enough estrogen, progesterone. These are important things in your body. To the point that, you know, people supplement with these things either, you know, to a super physiological state to, you know, because they want more of these effects, uh, you know, like taking anabolic steroids or, you know, just replacing back to physiological levels as, as we age to feel younger and feel better and to age uh, a little, you know, a little more gracefully, I guess you should, you could say. So, you know, we vilified the wrong thing here and, and people have paid for it. Protein is definitely one of those things. And probably that, that's a really weird one because people are saying that, no, actually you want to be weak and feeble and skinny. And it's called sarcopenia is when you're, you're, you're under muscle. Um, you know, and, and people like, um, who was it? Furman who wrote the, who wrote a book about the Gomes diet, greens, onions, mushrooms, beans, and seeds. He's like, this is basically all that you should eat. Just big, these big salads with this and maybe a little bit of meat. He's just this just raw food, vegan push guy. He does not look healthy. He isn't healthy. 
and he is very, very skinny, and he's sarcopenic, and he's saying that that's a good thing. You know, we don't want all this muscle that ages you, that makes you uh, die yeah. faster. And so, you know, I don't, you know, if I wanted to be like big and muscly and do a bunch of push ups, then yeah, yeah, fine, I'd eat some meat, but I don't. I want to live long and be healthy. And like, you know, there's actually a relationship between this. You know, physical and mental health actually plays into longevity. You know, like this is so strange. People say that, you know, like, well, yeah, if you just want to like just burn out and just, you know, go on a flash of glory, like, yeah, eat a bunch of meat and you'll just be really strong, really healthy, and then you'll just die at 40, you know? Uh, or you could eat a bunch of plants and feel like crap and, and linger on for another 40 years. I'm Even like, if mm. that is true, which one would you prefer? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, but, you know, that wouldn't really make sense, though, if, if we are healthier, if our bodies and brains work better. You're not just like on a transient basis, like you do a bunch of cocaine and you're, you're lit up. And then you have a drop off. I mean, just all the time. You are healthier all the time. You're not taking any substances. Wouldn't that stand to reason that that was actually the optimal nutrition for you? And if you're optimally, you know, if, if you're if this is optimal for your brain and your body, then wouldn't that be wouldn't that perpetuate your health long term? Wouldn't that make you age properly as well? You know, so it's um it, it doesn't really make sense about that, and so. In fact, not a lot of people are eating enough meat. So in fact, most people are eating under the amount of meat. And this, this is by like, you know, various governmental bodies talking about like, this is how much, you know, protein that you need, <clears throat> you know, per kilogram, you know, people are not even getting close to that, but they look at that as a minimum. This is not like, this is a target. This is a minimum. This is something that Dr. Balish said talks about as well, is that this is, this is, this is a minimum amount of protein to just like, you know, like our, our minimum amounts for vitamins. And then you have deficiency. This is, this is a minimum amount of protein or you have a deficiency We're we're not even reaching that in a lot of, in most countries on average. And then people say, oh yeah, well, you're getting enough protein. Well, no, that's the minimum. You actually get more health benefits if you go above that. So, you know, the idea that we're getting too much protein, uh, there's literally zero evidence for that. And in fact, by their own guidelines, we were not even getting close to the minimum on average. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of dumb. And, you know, a lot of these things, you know, these are just statements that these guys make without any evidence either asked for or provided. And so, and, and so you ask these people, okay, what's your evidence? What's this, what's this based on? Whatever. They, they won't give you a good answer or they might give you, you know, that <clears throat> article that you were talking about, you know, that someone said, that, like, you know, that actually is just some on someone's flash drive. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, this this proves it, doesn't it? And I was like, well, not really. You know, so it's um, you know, it's uh, there are a lot of claims out there, but you just you just okay, based on what? What's your evidence? You know, yeah. that's what you have to ask. When it comes to uh, research about meat, everyone is like, uh, where are all the RCDs about carnivore diet? But then they don't ask the same questions when it comes to plant based diets, and they. Um, True publish an article that according to their own standards hasn't gone through peer review is just uh, presented at a um at a conference and it was mm -hmm. just the abstract the body wasn't there and mm -hmm. even uh, the abstract was was awful and it also confirmed my uh, guess that it was epidemiological research and it was just uh, I, I can um, I should actually leave the link in the show notes because I made that very day I made a Persian podcast on it and I said uh, vegetarians are healthier than uh, car carnivores or meeting eating people according to an article published on Google Drive yeah and yeah, uh, yeah I will definitely show that so many of the research uh, so much of the research is like that and um, so much of the dogma is just based on uh, opinions by quote unquote reputable or highly influential doctors um, that made them and they have become dogma. And if you ask who said that, it's just no, it's just in our textbooks. And mm -hmm. if you trace that back, you get to the source and you see that it is just an idea probably. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of that, unfortunately. 
And, uh, you know, with that whole thing about protein being bad for the kidneys, I mean, that was, that was, that was never, that wasn't even based on a study. That was just pure supposition. And, and unfortunately it's, um, you know, that's actually more common than you, than you like to believe in the medical field, but, you know, the medical field is, you know, it, a lot of it is more art than science, especially, <sighs> especially now, but, you know, you know, I, I, I want to say before, but, you know, honestly, before people, people use, it was much more uh, robust, actually, they, they actually did real experiments. Now you have uh, ethical considerations. You can't actually run the, the wild experiments on people mm-hmm. that they used to, they actually did, they used to do some crazy shit and um, you can't do that. You know, it's, it's just, it's just unethical. You can't do that anymore, but they used to, they used to, they used to do some pretty, pretty crazy things, especially in the psychology departments. Oh my God. They used to, they used to just torture these kids. You know, that guy, what was in um, the Unabomber, um, Ted Kaczynski, he was, what was he at MIT or where was he? anyway, he, he was, you know, very, very bright kid, uh, you know, the mathematics department there. And they like, they just decided to do these psychological experiments on him and other students. And they just messed with these guys heads while they were, were studying and just, you know, um, I, it's hard to hard to prove one way or the other if that's what turned this guy into the Unabomber and turned this guy into a crazy killer. But you know, that is something that happened. You know, they they did all these crazy psychological experiments on this guy, and he is nuts. So you know, it's um you know it's it's a bit wild what they did. But you know, obviously, you know, you hear the stories of of the the you know the Nazis during World War II and the medical experiments that they did. And, and the Japanese who did actually far worse things uh, during World War II as well, all across Asia, you know, they, those are, those are things that you can't actually do ethically. And these obviously weren't ethical. They were, they were torturing these people, giving them diseases, watching that disease course through them to see exactly what this disease does in, in the later stages. And, and often, you know, killed all these people at the end of it. And so it was, you know, it was really, really disgusting stuff. And, you know, you obviously can't do that, but, you know, bef- you know obviously those guys aside, you know, people actually did experiments and they, and they tried to study things. They tried to have evidence based, uh, you know, for, for their recommendations. They said, well, this is the evidence and then we've done these experiments and this is what we found. Maybe it's not, maybe another experiment later will be bigger and, and, and more well-designed and maybe it'll show something else. But right now this is the best that we got. We've sort of slipped away from that, you know, and, and we, we have actually less, you know, high quality evidence than that. And so, you, and, and, and like you said, we have a lot of opposition research as well that just comes out here and muddies the water and is intentionally uh, designed to muddy the water and to, and to skew the picture. So it's a, uh, it's a bit tough. And especially in, in, in uh, nutrition, like it's just all epidemiological studies that, uh, you know, they, they can only go so far. They can only show you so much, you know, they're very, they're, they are very limited, but people say, no, no, I study this in nutrition class. Therefore it must be true. You know, except that, you know, I know plenty of, of PhDs and masters and, and, you know, bachelor's degrees in, in nutrition. that think the exact opposite of other nutritionists with the exact same credentials. Exactly. This is, a, this is something that, you know, people, need to understand is it's not hard science. Medicine's not hard science either. Medicine by and large is a soft science. And we get a lot of studies that are just garbage and that you really have to just, just ignore because just people just publish just for the sake of publishing, because they just have to publish something because that's how you get your resume up. And that's how you get uh, onto different programs and onto you know, different jobs. You just have to publish, publish, publish. And it's, it's crap. It's crap research, you know? And so you have to, you have to weed through all that stuff and uh, to actually see, you know, where the goal is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so many people say that, well, you, you're not a doctor. How dare you make such claims? And I say, mm-hmm. okay, I am not a doctor, but I am listening to a lot of doctors and they have the same credentials as the doctors that you are following. So mm-hmm. maybe give that thing it. Uh, a chance and give some thought maybe that works for you and for those who are uh, listening when Dr. Jaffe was talking about meat uh, he pointed to his impressive biceps and uh, well speaking of that uh, could you talk about your exercise regimen 
Uh, yeah, I can. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. Um, but just, but just, a, just, a, just a, a quick comment on, on what you were saying. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they say it's like, oh, you know, you're not a doctor. It's like, yeah, I'm not a, you know, I may not be a doctor, but I can read. You know, and I can, you know, there's a lot of things that you can just read and that just show this is nonsense and studies written by doctors and researchers that show this is nonsense. So I'm like, just read that. Um, and they're saying you're not a doctor. Are they a doctor? Well, then they should probably shut up. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, yeah. you know, if you, you know, if, if that's the game you're going to play, you know, then, you know, you can play at that. And they're saying you're not a doctor. So you can't comment on it. It's like, okay, well then you can't come on, comment on it either because you're not a doctor you know, let the doctors talk about it. You know, this doctor I'm looking at, he's saying this, yours is saying that neither of us are doctors, let them talk about, it. you know, but uh, yeah, no, that's stupid. Um, obviously anyone, anyone uh, can educate themselves and be, be literate in the, in the, uh, in the, the literature. So, you know, that's not, that's, uh, that's a silly thing for people to, to say. Um, as far as my workout regime, I, 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 well, I, you know, I've, I've played sports, you know, to a high, high level since I was a kid, you know, I trained to fight professionally since I was 14 years old. I was in, you know, one of the top MMA gyms in the world, AMC kickboxing in Kirkland, you know, with one of the top trainers, Matt Hume, since I was 14 years old, since my 14th birthday, I was there every hour, every day was open. And I just, I just trained and trained and trained with, with some of the top fighters in the world. And then I, you know, got in, I was wrestling all since I was a kid, I got into rugby and, you know, again, was playing with some, some excellent players with some fantastic coaches. It was an all American and, and went on and played professionally. I worked out all the time and I lifted weights all the time. I did sprint work all the time. Now I'm much more busy with, uh, with work as a doctor. I work, you know, anywhere from 90 to 135 hours a week, just like this past week, I worked all weekend and, and a few 36 hour shifts during the week. So it was a, it was a very big week. Um, I don't really have time to go to the gym, but because I have this base built up and I eat the way I do, I just maintain it. And so I I look like I work out all the time, but I really actually haven't worked out regularly in in a few months. Um, I was working out pretty regularly, sort of trying to go like sort of four days a week, um, before I went down, you know, back to America back in October. And then when I was there in October, November, I had a you know, a gym set up at, um, at my family home there. And so I would work out regularly. So I was, you know, another, you know, five, 10 kilos heavier than I am now, just muscle. And you know, since then I've only sort of been to the gym every couple of weeks, if that, you know, sometimes it was actually probably a couple months before I went back to the gym when I got back. But when I go, my, my routine is working out Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And I have just a, a routine that I've just developed over the years of different exercises that I find work the best for all the different major muscle groups, you know, that I've just sort of, you know, pieced together, uh, over the years. And I do similar sort of body groups Monday and Thursday, and then Tuesday and Friday, and then I'll do legs every day. I'll always do something with legs every day. The legs are, are big, strong muscles. You can, you can work them every day, especially on a carnivore diet. You can just, you can just really go. And, and then on top of that, I would normally have rugby practice. I would and I'd have sprint work and, and conditioning you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then have games on Saturday. And so that was on top of my lifting schedule. So just lifting, those would be my days. And I would just sort of do legs every day, at least to some degree. And then maybe on Wednesday, if I had time, I'd just do a dedicated leg day, or maybe on the weekend, I'd do a dedicated leg day, or just do hill sprints or stair sprints as well. So um, that's that's sort of my main thing. The, the The main thing about working out is consistency. I'm I've not been consistent, so I don't have the results that I would that I would have had, you know, just in just in you know October, November of last year. But I've maintained most of that just because of, of my diet. But if you really want to get that physique, it's just about consistency. You know, if you're going, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you need to go on those days every day. And eventually it will become habit. You have to just force yourself just like, no matter what's going to happen, come hell or high water, I'm going to the gym. I will be working out. I'm doing these muscle groups on these days. And I find that after a couple of weeks of that, then you get into a pattern of it and, and then you, you're actually looking forward to it. And you're like, oh, I actually have 45 minutes 
now between these two things, I can just go and do a quick workout. And you actually find a lot more time. And when you're, you're, you're doing that, you're, you find you're much more efficient. You actually use your day better. So you, you don't waste as much time and you get a lot more done, which is great because then you're looking at other things in your life as well. Like, Oh, I need to study this. Oh, I'll have, you know, an hour to do it here. I'm going to do it there. And so you just get a lot more done. And so it's just the consistency of going and you just build this stuff up over the years. And then when you're at the gym, you're just, you're, you're working out to muscle fatigue, to muscle exhaustion. You work yourself until you can't go anymore. And that's how you get the, the big results. So if you're going, you say, okay, I want to do 10 reps of this weight and you get to 10 and it's, it's really hard to do that, but you could do 12, you need to do 12. I consider those last two reps. That's the actual workout getting to the point where you're really exhausted and you just force out another couple. That's what really makes the difference is just those last couple. And the, and the difference between just those last couple, couple reps is the difference between, you know, me and other people who I worked out with regularly and never got the results that I had, you know, because they were, they were never, they were never really pushing themselves that hard. They were just sort of lifting weights. And I remember you know, talking to some friends of mine, they're saying, Oh yeah, I go to the gym every day. I'm lifting weights every day. And I'm looking at them like, I, it doesn't look like you've been to the gym in your life, but that's what they do. They just sort of do some things and kind of push some things around. And, you know, maybe that's good enough to sort of maintain where you are, but it's not really going to get you any significant results. So that would be my, my main thing. So say like on a Monday, what I would do, I would do like flat bench, incline bench, decline if you, if you had it, but, or, or just dips are fine. And then do some sort of flies. There, there are different sorts of machines that you can do where you, or, or cables where you're pushing across the body and that gets more like, because this is, this is what your, your pecs are supposed to do is, is adduct your, your shoulder. Okay. So that comes across the body. So you're getting these muscle fibers across the body and that's, that's good to develop those. Um, I'll always do, I always try to do some abs if I can. And although I haven't you know really been on that as well, but, um, and then, always do some legs and then, uh, triceps and abs. So that would be like a Monday or something like that. And then Tuesday would be back shoulders, maybe some biceps and again, legs. And, um, and then like a dedicated leg day, we're just absolutely going to town on your legs. You're doing sprints as well. And then sort of repeating that and then doing different exercises for those different body parts on the Thursday, Friday. And and you just do that. And so you you can sort of switch it up, but whatever you do, I mean, some people do like push, pull legs. That's great. You know, you do push, pull legs, push, pull legs, and then rest on Sunday, start it over again. If you're on carnivore, if, you know, yeah, you could do that anyway, really. But like the great thing about being on carnivore is a, it maintains it. B you get a lot more out of the exercises that you do and C your recovery is so much better that you can actually just keep going to the gym, but you have to be careful because you can, you can overwork yourself and you can actually get, you know, muscle tears and you can still develop tendonitis or, or you know, just tear something out because you just feel awesome all the time. And you're just going, 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 going. And, you know, I've developed, you know, some, some, uh, tears and tendonitis in my, in my pec once because I was doing, you know, 20 sets of bench, 20 sets of dips, everything, you know, like basically every day or every other day, um, because I could. And then after a couple of weeks of that, I went down and started doing benches. Oh, okay, what the hell is that? And it was like, you know, basically I had this, this strange sort of tendon. I had to sort of you know take it easy after that to, to let that rest. And it's like, okay, so that, that was, that was too far, but it took a while, it took a while to get to that point where I actually started damaging myself, but you can damage yourself. And so just work within your limits, but really try to push your limits and see what your limits are. Because it was, it was me doing 20 sets of bench, 20 sets of dips, basically every day or every other day that I was able to to hit that limit. So it was, you know, it, it's, you know, people have a lot more in the tank than they think they do. And, you know, if you really push yourself, you know, that's how you'll get, you know, real lasting results and diet. Yeah. That's yeah. most important. Yeah, definitely. Uh, actually by changing diet, I also saw an improved muscle mass and actually, well, I was losing a lot of fat too, which made uh, the muscles more visible, even if there was not uh, a lot and there was not a lot of that there, just removing the fat helped a lot. And then 
the recovery was very fast. And especially with resistance training, because you are the person who is applying the pressure. I would say that even if you go to failure, if you fatigue yourself, which you should do, mm-hmm. it is still very uh, much safer than, for example, martial arts that I am really interested in and I am pursuing. Mm-hmm. And you can really do um, resistance exercise every day. I have done that in the last summer, especially I don't know what effect sunlight has on me. Um, I don't eat plants, but like plants, I do kind of photosynthesis probably. And that makes my recovery faster. And I could do that and I wouldn't uh, feel any pain. And uh, however, with um, recently I've become so much interested in MMA and especially Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is a recent addition. I see that because the it is the other person that is applying the pressure that gets tricky. And though I can feel that I can go to the class, there are some days that I have to take off. Otherwise, my... Uh, the tendons in my knee will start hurting. Mm. Well, you got you got to work with people that aren't that that know what they're doing and have control as well, because you know if you're practicing your know, arm bars or knee locks or or whatever, uh, and someone's just going way too far and and actually injuring your your ligaments, like you know, that means that they're you know they need to rein that back and they need to to learn a bit more control. You know, it's it, it's you want to, you want to know sort of your, what your limits are as, as a, as a, as a competitor, you know, when someone's doing that and it hurts, but then, you know, we would do in training where we would sort of, you know, they would show us something like, Oh, okay. And you, you would tap and they go like a little further. So you'd be like, and so you, you would understand, actually you could have taken a bit more and, and you understand the limitations of your body so that you can do that sometimes just to sort of you know, uh, know that, but you can't do that all the time because you will damage yourself and you will, will damage your ligaments. And so if, so if, if you're sort of getting to that point where you have to like take, take days off or several days off because of that, that means that, you know, you need to sort of talk to your, your sparring partners and your, and your mm-hmm. wrestling partners to just be like, Hey, you know, you need to, you need to chill out. And, uh, you know, because you don't, you don't want to be injuring your own, your own teammates, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I have seen that the ones who are more, more advanced and know what they are doing and don't have to prove that they are, they know better than you. It is uh, going to be the least, uh, it is going to be the be- best uh, s- uh, session or best part of exercise because they are, uh, you are less likely to get damaged or injured. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, they understand what they're doing more on that. Yeah. Have more control. So, yeah. Yeah. So definitely, definitely talk to the people that, <laughs> that are doing that. Just be like, Hey, you know, don't, don't, don't do that too much or whatever. And uh, hopefully they listen. They're not, you know, because you should be, you should be, you know, uh, you shouldn't be a practice hero, you know, like you, you yeah. should be able to you know, uh, work well with your teammates because you're all, you're all trying to grow and you're there helping them and they're help, mm-hmm. helping you. So they need to recognize that. So mm-hmm. hopefully they do. Yeah. And to be fair, part of it was also um, because of too much pressure from my, and myself in a closed uh, a closed card i was pushing a bit uh, applying a, a bit so much of pressure but when you learn more techniques and you realize that you don't have to put that much pressure on your feet and and the pressure wouldn't go, go to your knees as a result and mm-hmm. some of it and, and a larger part of it is actually the the pressure applied by the others which needs mindfulness on our part and their part and speaking of mma uh, martial arts and actually uh, the first interview we had i didn't know that you also did mma Mm. Uh, there's a funny convergence among people who are into carnivore most of us are for weightlifting there are for example, Zach Peter, yeah, he is a professional runner, but mostly we do we are proponents of resistance training and do resistance training. When mm-hmm. it comes to martial arts, many of us do BJJ and MMA, and we are um, partial towards that. Uh, so it's very interesting to see these convergences and these uh, shared interests. And I'm sure that we are going to discover more of that. 
what's your view of martial arts and in particular MMA? Yeah, I, well, I, I think that they're fantastic sports and there's something that are obviously I really, really enjoyed them growing up. And I, I, I really wish that I had kept with it while I was playing rugby as well. I, I sort of didn't really have, I didn't think that I had time to do both and in order to compete out of AMC at the time, you, you had to, you had to basically make training every single day. And I was like, well, can I miss just one day a week just to play rugby, you know, because it's, a, it's at their act, the exact same time and I'll, I'll skip every other practice that they have. And I'll be at every single training, every hour of every day that, you know, uh, you guys are open if I can just miss this one practice. And they were like, well, look, we, we only just made the rule. We, we can't like just break it, you know, make an exception right away. And I, I totally understood that. And I just sort of, because that's the thing, if you, if you didn't make all those things, you, you weren't able to fight out of the, of the gym. And I was just, I was very, very anxious to fight out of the gym. And I was, I was waiting to turn 18 so I could start having, you know, more fights and, 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 uh, and, and start, you know, you know, making a, a push to fight professionally. I was really, really eager to do that. And uh, then I sort of looked at that and said like, okay, well, I, I, I want to do both. I, I really don't want to give up rugby. You know, I just got back from New Zealand, you know, on the, the all American tour and I absolutely loved it. And I was, I was so passionate about it. And I just, I really didn't want to give that up. And so I thought I was like, well, if I, you know, I can't, you know, fight, then I guess I can't, can't train. I, and, but, I, I, you know, obviously I could have just kept training. I just didn't even think about that. I just didn't even think about it that way. And so unfortunately I, I stopped doing that, but I absolutely love it. I think it's a fantastic sport. I think it's, so good to understand yourself as a person and your own limits and, and, and really just pushing yourself when you're on a team, that's, that's, that gives fantastic skills as well, because you're working with a team, you're pushing hard, you're all working towards a common goal and you have to work cohesively. It gives a lot of life lessons uh, for the rest of your life. And, you know, working on the team, you know, just working in business or in the hospital, you have to work with a whole lot, a lot of different moving parts and you have to all, you have to, you have to fit into that role. Well, when you're, but you, you can kind of sort of you know, hide a bit of your bad habits in a, in a team sport. Sometimes you, other people can sort of take, take care of it. You can sort of, you know, you know, drag it for a little bit and maybe you don't, you don't play as hard as you could have every second of the game, but it doesn't really have that much of an effect because you have your teammates covering for you. That does not work in an individual sport of any, of any description, you're running a race. It's only you running that race. You're going to get the time that you get based on the effort and the training and, and ability that you have. If you're wrestling, it's just you, you know, no one else is going to be able to, you know, tag in and, and help you out. Like you need to be able to do this. And so things like MMA, you know, it, it just, it really puts a spotlight on you and how you have to focus and you have to get yourself going uh, to be your best. And if you're going to compete and if you're going to succeed, you know, it's, it's only you that are going to, that, that is going to uh, dictate how well you do in your given set of circumstances. So I think it's, I think it's a fantastic uh, disciplinary measure as well. It just shows you like, I need to work hard. I need to do this better. And, uh, and, and it's very rewarding too, because you can, all of a sudden you're getting results and you're doing things uh, that other people can't, and you're doing better than other people. You know, that, that's a very rewarding sensation. And it really tells you that you know, hard work pays off and that you can push yourself and you can do something that, uh, you know, you can work hard enough to then get success out of things. And, and now, you know, that for other things that you put in the hard work and you get it. Um, and I, I really loved, uh, MMA. I, I loved my time at AMC. I, I still sort of fantasize about, you know, when I go back to, you know, Seattle, you know, going out there and, and training there again, because I absolutely loved it. And, you know, uh, Matt Hume's still a trainer there. The guy's just absolutely still, just amazing. You know, I see updates of his on, on Facebook, the guy's just still just ripped and just killing it. You know, <laughs> he's just a badass, and, uh, and, and such a, such a great guy and a fantastic, I mean, just a brilliant fighter and a brilliant trainer. So like, I've always wanted to get back into that. Um, it's just such, it, you know, it's, it's also very, very good to just understand, you know, how to be able to defend yourself you know, and be able to physically protect yourself and your loved ones. You know, I didn't continue on in, in the, the fighting realm and, and didn't fight professionally, certainly, but I was able to learn a set of skills that I was able to use 
in rugby and in life that have saved my ass on more than one occasion. And, you know, being a young man and really a kid playing in men's leagues and, you know, the Canadian premier league and the, the various U S leagues, you know, back then it was, it was really, you know, you really took your, your health in your hands uh, when you stepped on this field because they were, they were not well, well, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the lower level games, when you're just first starting, they're seriously not well refereed. There's only one referee. You don't have all the touch judges and, and the, and the cameras on you, like the, looking out, finding different penalties, you know, you, you get, you get away with a lot of stuff then. And a lot of these guys really just played rugby so that they could assault people. They just wanted to be able to just fight people and beat the hell out of people and, and, uh, and get away with it and not go to jail for it. And, and so, you know, you, you went out there and people were absolutely trying to kill you. And so you had to, you had to be willing to, to fight back and you had to be willing to kill them. And so, you know, I, when I went in physically to point of contact with it, with tackling, tackling someone or running with the ball, like I absolutely tried to absolutely kill people. You know, I, you know, I, I would be running upon someone, maybe they were, they were bigger than me. And I was just having in my head, I was just like, you know, I may die here, but I'm going to damn well take you with me. You know, and so I just threw myself in with everything that I had. And if you hit someone harder than they hit you, it's simple physics. They take all of the hit and you don't feel anything. And you just go right through them and just pile them into the ground. And so I learned that, you know, very early on. And so it was just a, you know, uh, uh, just a point of protection. Like I'm just going in with just reckless abandon and just trying to just kill somebody. And I just, it, it, it saved me, preserved my, my body and my health, but people would try to attack you and fight you and, you know, punch you. I had a guy try to gouge my eye out when I was 19, stuck in the bottom of a pile, you know, people stomping on your head with, you know, you know, big cleats stomping on your joints. People are trying to absolutely mess you up. And this stuff wasn't getting picked up at that time. And so you could get away with murder. And so I just, you know, decided early, like I was not going to, I was not going to allow people to do that. I was not allow them to hit me illegally uh, you know, you know, start, you know, throw punches or do any of these sorts of things. I just, I would not accept that. And so when some do that, you know, I would, I would go at them. And so I got in a lot of fights. I got in a lot of fights, uh, you know, throughout my rugby career, especially in the beginning, because I was, I was just this little skinny whip of a kid. And so they were like, yeah, this is, this is, this is the guy we're going to pick on, you know, we'll just mess with this guy. And, you know, because they're 10 years older than me, sometimes more. And so they think like, yeah, we'll go after this guy and he'll go off crying to mommy. And like, Nope, wrong guy. And so, you know, and then you're going around and you're traveling around the world and you're in England and uh, you know, I was playing rugby there and I was traveling around Europe and, you know, you get into situations that were, you know, not, not safe and, you know, knowing how to handle myself physically uh, was, was a, was a very, very uh, big benefit to me in a lot of, in a lot of ways. So I think it's, I think it's something important. My kids will certainly be, doing martial arts. If that's, if that's what they want to do, obviously I won't force them to do anything, but I think, uh, but I would definitely encourage that. It's something that will give them a lot of confidence and discipline and understanding how, uh, how much hard work pays off. And also they will, they will know how to, to defend themselves and protect themselves, which I think is very important. And uh, as your, in your experience as an MMA fighter and well, actually training in MMA. I mean, I never, I never fought professionally or anything like oh, that. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, in, in uh, that experience, what individual martial, uh, martial arts did you find the most beneficial? And uh, in which way did you take the classes? For example, you just went to MMA classes and that was the title of the class, or you took a <laughs> combination of classes, for example, boxing and jiu-jitsu or for example mma and uh, sorry uh, muay thai and boxing and jiu-jitsu what combination did you take if it was a combination if it was mma which part of it do you find the most important yeah so what we, we did it at amc was uh muay thai kickboxing for mm -hmm. uh, our standing and then pancreation for the ground, oh. uh, ground fighting. So pancreation, uh, if it, you know, not everyone knows what it is. Everyone really knows what you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is because it was obviously very popularized you know, by the Gracie brothers and, and the Gracie family. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a great technique. Pancreation goes back to the ancient Greeks 
uh, and it was in the original Greek games and it was submission wrestling. They had wrestling, they had submission wrestling, they had, they had different sort of fighting. These were, these were the fighting techniques. So this is, this is based on, on, you know, collegiate Greek wrestling, you know, so this is a very, very hard, um, discipline to beat. There, there really aren't chinks in the armor. You see like things like Taekwondo or, uh, you know, even Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there are things that are a bit more flashy, and they have weaknesses. Whereas like, you know, Muay Thai kickboxing, just the, you know, the, the, the really core of it, it's just very solid. It's very solid defense. Yeah. It's very solid offense. It's almost scientific in its attack and defense. Same with pancreation. You know, you, you, you know, the Greeks looked at things in, in a very mathematical, methodical, log logical way. And they're like, what is the best move here in this position? What's the best thing you can do in this position? What's the best thing you can do in, and developing these different techniques that would be the strongest style. Obviously it all comes down to the individual and the decisions they make at the time and, and what they can do. So obviously, you know, someone who's you know excellent at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu can beat someone who's excellent at, at pancreation, but you know, traditionally you look at the, at the UFC, uh, it's a lot of the wrestlers that, that were winning. So Matt Hughes, as opposed to Matt Hume, uh, he was, you know, a, a champion for a long, long time. He actually beat Hoist Gracie. Hoist Gracie came out of retirement to, to fight him and, and Matt Hughes, uh, you know, beat him very handily. Matt Hume is another one. He's, you know, he had a wrestling background. He does pancreation. He, he's the one who taught me pancreation. This guy was brilliant. I mean, I have never seen anyone as technically perfect as Matt Hume. He has perfect technique. And this is as close to as perfect a style as you can get. And so if you do it right and you do these moves, the, you are going to win. You, you, you just are, you know? And so that's why he was so successful in his fighting career. Um, but I really like pancreation. We, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is great, but there, there are there are some things that have, uh, you know, a few weaknesses, you know, there's like, you know, like in, in pancreation or wrestling, you do a double leg or a single leg. This is, this is a strong technique for a takedown. Uh, there was a move. I don't know if people are still doing it now, maybe they've gotten rid of it, but you know, they would go in and shoot, but they would also sort of hook their foot behind the opposite, the opponent's ankle and sort of trip them up backwards. And that's fine. That can, that can get the guy down, but now you, you don't have a post on that side. So that guy can go down and just roll you over, right? So we actually would, we had classes where we would just we would go over the different moves that you might face when fighting someone who uh, you know was Brazilian Jiu Jitsu trained or Jiu Jitsu trained, and and the, these were these were how to counter those moves specifically. So uh, it wasn't like just an MMA class. We'd have at like you know four o'clock there would be like a kickboxing class or a boxing class, and then five there would be like Muay Thai class and seven, there would be a, you know, a, you know, a kick or, or a kickboxing or whatever class. And then at seven, seven to 10, it was fighters training. So people who wanted to fight, who people who wanted to compete and fight out of the gym, you had to go to that, that training. So I would go from, I would show up at four o'clock. I would be there until 10 o'clock every single day, every single day of the week. And then Saturdays, they would, they would have some sparring sessions on Saturdays. And I, I occasionally went to that. I didn't always, because it wasn't, there was only a few people would, would go to that. The main stuff was during the week. And so I would go, you know, Monday through Friday, I was there from four to 10 every damn day for you know, years. And so, yeah, I would take every single class and then I would do the fighters training, every single class fighters training. Yeah. Every day. So, and, and you're, you're, you're rolling around and training with, actual professional fighters. My, you know, my sparring partner when I was 17 was, um, um, was, uh, Josh Barnett, who's in the MMA world of fame, well, hall of fame, you know, he was, he was the youngest ever UFC heavyweight champion, um, beat, um, who was it, it was the natural Randy Couture. He beat Randy Couture. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the championship and, and, you know, beat him quite handily, like one in about, uh, you know, like a minute 40 or something like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so, you know, he was, he was, you know, a great fighter. And um, you know, I, I was there just before he went professional and um, but, you know, like when I started when I was 14, this was like, this is how old I am. <laughs> like this is uh, right at, right before UFC three, and when uh, Kimo was going to fight um, Shamrock in the, in the super fight. And so Kimo was fighting in AMC and training for that, that fight with Shamrock. 
and he had just, you know, he'd gotten his, uh, his name from, um, you know, having fought Gracie, Hoist Gracie in, in UFC two, and, uh, you know, he ended up getting submitted, but he basically physically pounded Hoist Gracie to such an extent that Gracie couldn't go on and fight in the finals. And so, you know, they, they say like, oh, well, okay, this guy's got something to him. And so, you know, that, that's, that's how long I've been training there. And, um, you know, so that's, that's what, we, yeah, so that's what we do. So you had, you had classes during the day and then you had the fighters training. So you're training with these, these professional fighters and you're just learning as much as you can from them, sparring with them, rolling around with them, doing all these things. And, uh, yeah, it was absolutely just fantastic, uh, experience. Beautiful. And let's shift, uh, shift gears uh, here. We wanted to talk about something beyond uh, diet and carnivore we all, we've already uh, uh, had. And let's go beyond. And I have realized that in one of your posts, you you talked about Thomas Sowell, and he's a, a very influential guy that I have recently um, recently become familiar with and following. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, I used to be a Chomsky guy. Uh, it, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and a lot I of people are, you know. I mean, it's a, it's it's understandable. You know, he makes he makes very good arguments, but uh-huh. it's difficult yeah. to stay being a pro Chomsky, especially uh, you, you know. I did my MA thesis uh, with Chomsky's framework, and I could mm-hmm. see some. I mean, his manufacturer of uh, um, constant was re- a really good book that I use in my thesis, and I would still say that the same framework is valid for so uh, so much of the media analysis. But uh, the way that he calls himself an anarchist, and at the same time he is pro big government, that's a big contradiction that is not possible to reconcile, and. Um, maybe really it was a communist. Really, really, what he is. Really, what really he is. is really, what he is. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, he's very hypocritical in saying that he's an anarchist. He's a re- really communist, yeah. and so some of his views are really abhorrent. For example, <laughs> yeah, uh, he, he um, his thesis is that any country that is not America and doing all sorts of uh, genocides or atrocities that is justified and uh, be- just because they are not America and America has made them do that. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, so it was a quite big shift for me um, to move from that and uh, grow out of that and get to know Thomas Sowell and so many Uh, of other guys and now i I identify as a real anarchist which Mm -hmm. is a friendly to to capitalism so it is anarcho-capitalism and maybe one of the uh, most realizations that i came across was that anarcho-communism is an oxymoron so uh, Mm -hmm. could you um talk about your interest in Thomas Sowell and his ideas and which one of them well it is very difficult to choose and which one of them do you find the most eye-opening mm-hmm. and which one of them has influenced you the most yeah no, I absolutely love Thomas Sowell is you know is this someone that literally four generations of my family have have been reading Thomas Sowell you know my great wow. my um Yeah, my my great grandmother, um, my my grandmother and her brothers, my parents, and and now me, um, you know. So and this this guy is brilliant. You know, he's in his 90s. He's been writing for decades and decades and decades, and he's still writing. Like he said, he published a book, I think, on his 91st birthday, on uh, charter schools and their enemies. That's what it was called. And, you know, the man is absolutely brilliant. I honestly think that he is the most brilliant and well-developed thinker that America has ever produced. He's just second to none. I don't think there's someone, you know, there are a lot of people that are are absolutely stunningly brilliant, like his good friend and mentor, Milton Friedman. But I I just, I just think that Thomas Sowell just takes the cake. Um, He writes a book about 
uh, intellectuals and you know people like Noam Chomsky, yeah. and, he, and he talks about these things and he talks about their ideas and he and he just you know uh, dissects them and talks about them. No one digs deeper to the bedrock of an issue than than Thomas Sowell. Like no one digs. He just really just gets in there and say like, okay, what is actually going on here? And he doesn't have vested interests. He just, he just wants to understand what's happening. And so he just digs in there to find out. And I think that that idea of, of pure empiricism is what I like the most about him. And what I've gotten the most from him is that, you know, he just, he just takes everything empirically and say, okay, you know, let's look at this analytically and see what is the evidence for it. He was actually a Marxist growing up. He grew up very, very poor. He's a black man. He was born in 1930 in the Deep South during the Great Depression, during Jim Crow. This guy had a very hard life. And then he grew up in a slum and he was in the slums of Harlem during World War II and beyond. He dropped out of school when he was you know, test- tested in a Stuyvesant High School, which is a, you know, a, a gifted program, an honors high school in New York. And he tested into there and then he had to drop out when he was like 16 because he was having family issues and he needed to go and he needed to work and support himself. And having dropped, and then he got drafted into Korea and was in the military for a few years. And then he started going to college and, and, you know, having not even graduated high school, this guy had learned enough and worked hard enough that he ended up getting an academic scholarship to Harvard and graduated with honors and actually wrote his, his master or his, his honors thesis at Harvard on Marxist capitalism or Marxist uh, uh, economics. And, you know, the reason being is that he said that, you know, Marx was talking about the differences in, in wealth and disparities. No one else was really addressing that. And so he was the only, he was only dog in the fight. And so he's reading that going like, why am I so poor and my family so poor and my life so hard when I'm seeing, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue and all these, you know, big, you know, gleaming buildings and all these people living this much better life than me. Marx addressed that. No one else was really addressing that. And so he was a Marxist. He was a Marxist taking Milton Friedman's uh, class at Chicago, getting his PhD. You know, he got his, he, his uh, advisors in uh, getting his PhD in economics were George Stigler, Milton Friedman, and Friedrich Hayek, three Nobel Prize winners in economics. And was the three main uh, economists that brought back a free market thought to the, to the Western world before, you know, otherwise they were socialists or Keynesians or, or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Thomas Sowell himself was, was a Marxist and he took this, these classes from these people who were now fully in, in, in you know, of the mind, uh, mindset that free market uh, economics was, was the better way to go. And that, you know, that didn't even sway him until he actually worked in the government for the labor department and saw exactly how the government works. And he said, okay, no, this is not the way <laughs> government is not the answer. And so he just started looking at this and he says that, you know, that he was an empiricist before he was a Marxist. And so that's what it was. And so we actually started seeing evidence that like, you know, these bureaucracies have their own uh, incentives and own, own values and their own drives that are not in keeping with actually making society run better. They, they're looking after themselves. They're looking after their own budgets and they're looking after their own agendas. So, you know, he, he found that this was actually not a good thing. Um, his books are so insightful and they're so straightforward. They're so clear. And you, and his, his papers, his, his columns as well. Like he's, he's just written for so many decades and he's just a brilliant writer that he can boil down extremely complex issues into a 750 word essay where you're just looking at, it, you're like, yeah, that's, that's bulletproof. That's airtight. He's like, you know, here's what they're saying. Here's what these guys are saying. Here's the history. Here's the background. Here's this evidence. You just go, yep. Okay. And he doesn't tell you, this is what you should think. He just shows you, here's the evidence. Here's what's going on. Here's what's actually going on. And you just go like, yeah, okay. That, that's obvious. <laughs> that's, that's definitely what's happening. And so and, and his books are even, even better. And so, you know, some of his books, like there was, um, you know, economic uh, facts and fallacies is just a great, great place to start. You know, because it just shows just how many things that we take for granted, you know, like we do, like, you know, we do in medicine, like, oh, this is just what we've been told. So that's just what it is, are just absolute crap. And, and he just, and he shows the hard evidence of that. And so, you know, that's a great, great place to look at. And this is, you know, it's, it's really reading Thomas Sowell 
that, that has really sort of allowed my brain to work in the way that I can sort of look at me like, okay, that sound, sounds like bullshit. Is this bullshit? And like looking in there and, and knowing how to, to ask questions and knowing how to find answers just by reading his, his work and, you know, things like, you know, wealth, poverty, and politics, and, and so many others, I mean, they're just such brilliant works and, uh, you know, just basic economics is, is, a, is probably his most successful book. And it just really, it just really boils down just, just economics. And it's, uh, it's, it's actually an interesting read, uh, but it's actually a textbook and his other books are not textbooks, but this textbook is actually one of his best selling books. And because it really just does boil down, this is how economics works. This is how, you know, this stuff affects your life and then uh, applied economics. Um, so called applied economics, thinking past stage one. I think it's, it's more, it's a masterclass on how to think as opposed to what to think. It really teaches you how to use your brain to analyze something and it's thinking past step one. That's, that's you know, part of the title. You look at this on face value, like, oh yeah, that's what that is. And so this is your conclusion. And as a, as an exercise that he had in Harvard, one of the professors says, okay, so that's your conclusion. Okay. And what would happen next? If that were to happen, then what would happen next? This would be the, okay, well, this would be the result. Okay. And then what would happen next? Well, this would be the result. And then what? And then what? And then what? And, and you go far enough down that, that uh, thought process, all of a sudden you realize like, ooh, actually, this, is, this isn't what I thought it was. This is actually going to have really bad ramifications. But it's like thinking like a chess player. You know, you have to think 20 moves ahead because that's how this works. That's how life works. You make a decision that's going to have far-reaching implications for, for the rest of your life, potentially. And so you really do actually need to think about what's going to happen and think about what's that going to be. Is it, we have so many examples of politicians just saying like, oh yeah, we need to do this policy because we need to help inflation and we need to help this or help that or whatever. Okay, so this little thing that you're doing now, it looks like it might help. Okay, but then what happens? And then what happens? And then what happens? You find out, oh, actually that makes inflation worse. That puts people out of jobs. That makes, you know, it makes it so you know, people are losing their homes. That's actually a bad thing. You know, so you have to, you have to think past stage one. And I think that, that just the, the, the examples that he uses and the way that he teaches you how to look at information and how to think about it, I think is, is, you know, has been so helpful to me in my own work and looking at, at information and looking at other people's arguments and being able to see, you know, the merits and the demerits of them and, and watching this guy debate live. Oh my God. Like this guy just just eviscerates people. He's a really nice guy, but he is so smart and he is so well-versed that people can make this big, long argument that people have been talking about for decades. And he will just say one word, one sentence, and it will just, just cut the whole thing short. And you just be like, Oh no, you know, it, it's actually, you know, it's actually funny at how easily he demand, dismantles these, these arguments. I mean, there's, there's a um, firing line with um, William, a., uh, William F. Buckley back in the, like 1981 with Thomas Sowell on it after he'd written a book talking about all these different sorts of issues that we are still talking about today that he's written, wrote, wrote a book about and disproved 40 years ago. And he had, you know, this uh, law professor uh, on the, on the show to challenge him because that's how, how firing line worked. If, if, if Buckley, uh, disagreed with you, he would challenge you. And he would, you know, so he had Noam Chomsky on there and just absolutely just, you know, tore his ass to shreds. But he would have, if he disagreed with you or maybe had a different viewpoint, he would, he would be very fair, but he would talk about it. It's like, well, in your book, you said this and your book, you said, and he would, he would challenge them. If he was more in line with their way of thought, like he would be with Thomas Sowell or Milton Friedman, he would have someone else on, or Friedrich Hayek, he was also on there. He would have them on, uh, he would have on a, uh, someone who would antagonize them, who had, who had the opposite view. And you know, it wasn't just some, some, you know, some chump off the street. This would be like a law professor who is a vocal in the, in, you know, in the opposite argument. And so we had this law professor uh, going after him and, and other times, you know, professors of, of economics from Columbia and, and so forth that, you know, would, would challenge him and, and so would just mop the floor with these people. And it was just, it was absolutely hilarious to watch. And so, you know, I've taken a lot of, uh, you know, debate techniques and styles from him as well. And just being able to 
look at things and, and, and try to look at things in a similar way and see how he just looks at the, like the keystone of their argument and just pluck it away and the whole, the whole, uh, um, you know, building falls down. And so I've been able to learn a bit from that. And, and so it's very, very interesting, but I just, lo- I just love listening to the guy speak. I just love seeing interviews with him. I love seeing debates with him and, uh, and just reading his books. I mean, I just don't, I, I just really don't know of anyone else who's, who's more interesting to watch and to listen to than that guy. I wish I had known him earlier and I wouldn't have wasted my time over Chomsky. I would have uh, <laughs> had a difficult time doing my MA because everyone think the way I did, which was pro left pro uh, Chomsky. Yeah. Um, and uh, actually maybe becoming a carnivore or, or kid at that time was very helpful. Mm-hmm. Helped me my critical thinking that, well, these things were lies. How about this? Maybe this mm. also doesn't hold water. Um, yeah. yeah, this guy could have um, really saved me, and I wish I had known him before. And I, I came to this realization. I mean, that more eye opening moment was when I saw the recent, not very recent, it's been over two years, the developments and the regime whose names cannot be even mentioned because we get the podcast down and all this um, weird shit that happened uh, lately that really opened my eyes that this thing can be really become uh, dangerous. And that's mm. when I said goodbye to all my old heroes. And I wish I had known him before and they wouldn't have ever become my heroes. And one yeah. of the very beautiful things that he once said that you also mentioned about uh, his um, criticism of intellectualism. Intellectuals are people, uh, this is his definition, intellectuals are, are people whose products are ideas. If you mm-hmm. see an engineer um, building a bridge, designing a bridge and it falls down, he will be blamed for it. They will be blamed for it. If you do a, a surgery battle, you will be blamed for it. Mm-hmm. But the ones who just produce ideas they simply get away with it. People yeah. can make uh, can promote ideas that are lethal. Um, we can look at look at examples in different fields, in economy, Marx, in um, medicine, Ansel Keys that has mm. uh, caused more death than any anyone. I would argue, yeah. and they are not even alive to just. Uh, answer for those um, evils and that has come out of their works yeah well yeah yeah Th- thankfully they're dead now it would be nice if they uh were around like Ansel Keys lived to be 100 the bastard so you yeah. know he uh <laughs> you know he, he probably I'm sure he didn't listen to a word of his own advice yeah you know, that guy knew, that guy knew exactly what was going on and he knew exactly what not to do because he's the one who put out the, the false information on it um but yeah yeah Thomas Sowell says that you know, it's a, it's a very bad idea to put the decision making in the hands of people who pay no price for being wrong. You know, because like, you think about it, someone, someone makes a decision saying this is how you need to live your life. OK, but it is you living your life. And so when that goes wrong, or if that goes wrong for you, that goes wrong in your life. That's yeah. your life up. You know, the person who said, no, 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 you have to do this. They pay no price for being wrong. Nothing happens to them. You know, you know, politicians that make these, these bad policies and they say, well, well, they'll, they'll get voted out. Yeah, maybe, but actually generally they spin it enough to make it, make people think that, you know, it wasn't them in the first place and it's someone else's fault and blah, blah, blah. But, but that, that's the thing, you know, you have, you have someone there dictating what, someone else needs to do in their life. No, this is how you have to raise your kids. This is how you have to raise your this. This is how you have to be like, why do you know more about my life than I do? That doesn't make any sense. You know, I mean, there's people that, you know, obviously uh, do better than other people and are more successful, but you know, you, you can't force people to be successful, you know, or else communism would work. You know, they tried to do that forced, uh, forced labor camps, forced work, you know, all these projects and like, forcing people to do whatever. And then, it just, it just doesn't work. So, you know, people have to be incentivized. They have, they have to want to, to you know, be successful at whatever they do. But when you have the government or whomever making these decisions, 
that don't affect them, you know, you have to, you have to sort of be suspect of that because, <clears throat> you know, think about, think about spending money, right? No one spends, you know, uh, their, their own money more carefully than them. You know, this is the, this is something that you earn. This is your money. This is your budget. And you're like, okay, what do I do with this? I've got to be careful. Or at least it's your mind. You're going to be doing something with this. If, if you're if you're spending someone else's money, you know, someone says is like, okay, oh, hey, you know, your mom gives you a hundred dollars, like you know, go you know, go buy some treats and you know, maybe a present or whatever. You're just you're just going to spend it on whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. You're going to buy some crap and some, you know, cookies and nachos, whatever. You're just going to buy whatever. Um, that's not going to be as efficient. You're not going to use that money as efficiently. You know, well, and and then you know you have. Uh, you know, the government entity is sort of a third, you know, think about government insurance, it's a third party payer, right? So if I'm getting healthcare, you know, I'm like, I'm sick, I have this problem, I need this surgery, I need to get this surgery, I go, okay, this is how much this surgery costs. And I think, okay, is that worth it to me? Yes, it is. I want this surgery, I pay for it, done deal. No middlemen, no problems. It's just like if I'm buying a deck, I want a deck. This is how much a deck costs. Like, ugh, yeah, okay, it's worth it to me. You know, I'm not going through a second party who's going to arrange one and maybe think about, do you really need a deck? And then say, okay, well, we'll, you know, we'll pay for this and blah, 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 blah. You're, you're going to, you're having a lot of steps in there that don't need to happen. And, you know, and then you have like this third party payer, which is like, you know, so it's like the government, uh, healthcare sort of thing. They're, so far removed from the decision-making process that not only do they not care what it costs, they also don't care what the quality is, right? So you care about the quality and the cost in your own health, right? An insurance company is worried about the cost. They're just trying to make a profit, okay? And so they're trying to provide you as good enough health care that you will stay with their insurance company, with that insurance company and probably not a lot more because they want to make a profit, right? And then you have a third party payer that doesn't care what the quality is, doesn't really care what the cost is because it's just tax dollars. They really just don't care. And so you end up getting, you, know, you end up getting lemons. And, uh, you know, this, this is a perfect example is the VA system in America. It's a very bad system and it doesn't work very well. And, and people uh, know about that in America. And yet they're saying, no, we should have the VA, you know, be, be the whole national program, basically, because they're saying they should have just a single party payer, just a single government medical, medical system. Well, that's what the VA is. And the VA is crap. And people have such long waiting times in the VA to see a doctor and a specialist that they're committing suicide. So that's obviously not a good thing when in comparison to the normal system in America, like, obviously, that's not very good. Well, the VA system is, you know, similar system to other government healthcare systems, like the government healthcare system in communist China and in communist North Korea and communist Cuba and for? communist the Russia. VA? The VA is a veteran, veterans affairs. So this is, this is for the military. Yeah. Military and veterans. Uh, this is the hospitals that they could go to. So if you're, you're a veteran, you go to the VA hospital. So they're, they're notoriously bad, you know, and the healthcare system in Russia was notoriously bad, the you know, communist USSR. And yet we're saying that this is something that we want now. You know, this is a third party payer. You're, you're very removed from this decision-making process, you know, and yet, you know, the, you know, the, the politicians, you know, don't, aren't in that system. They, so they're not beholden to it. You know, uh, in America, we had Obamacare and how you knew without knowing anything else that this was a bad program is that Congress exempted themselves and their families from Obamacare, you know? So, you know, if it's, if it's, like, if it's nothing if that it's they good, want anything to do with, it, this is good enough for you, but obviously I'm special. And that's what the, you know, they asked Obama. Someone said, okay, well, would, are you going to be beholden to this? Are you, is this going to be something that you're going to do? Is this, is this what you're going to do? And he's like, well, let's, you know, let's, let's be real here. I'm the president of the United States. Obviously my healthcare is going to be, you know, you know, very different than anyone else's and blah, blah, blah. So that, that, that's not really a real question. And they just sort of laughed it off. He never answered the question. You know, but of course, the answer is God. No, he doesn't want that. Obama want to didn't take that. Obamacare. No, of course he didn't. No, God, no. You know, and you wouldn't expect him to. But you know, but the thing is, he's not a monarch. He wasn't an emperor. That you, he should, he's not supposed to get special privileges like that. And so, you know, when you when you see these laws where the politicians have exempted themselves, 
you, you know, something's up, you know, you know, there's some bullshit at play. And so that's what they did. They exempted themselves with Obamacare. They've also exempted themselves from the insider trading laws. That's fun. This is why, you know, you know, people like Nancy Pelosi can go in with, you know, not a dime to their name. And now they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, because they're allowed to do insider trading. You know, there's a reason that wasn't, that wasn't uh, legal. And, you know, so it's, um, it's a bit, it's a bit suspect and, you know, not being able to uh, declare bankruptcy on student loans. That's, you know, that's something, you know, that's debt, you know, but no, you're not allowed to declare bankruptcy on that ever. That follows you forever. Unless you're the family member or child of someone in Congress, you know? So this is, this is all, you know, a bit of a sham. And so these people pay no price for being wrong. You know, in fact, they exempted themselves from the ramifications of their poor decisions because they know going into it that they're poor decisions. And so they just say, yeah, we don't have to do, deal with that. And so, yeah, that, that's one of the, one of the many, many uh, insights of, of, of Thomas Sowell is that you, know, you shouldn't be letting people make decisions if they don't have skin in the game. You know, it used to be that, you know, if you wanted to vote, you had to be a citizen and you, and by being a citizen, it wasn't just that you had to be a man is you, you had to own land. So you had, you were part of this game, you know, you own land, you're voting on what happens to the land in this country, but you also were eligible for the draft. You also had to be part of the militia. You also had to be part of the fire brigade. If you did not vote, if you were not a full citizen, you did not have any of those responsibilities. Mm. Voting was not a right. It was a privilege that came with responsibilities. And so not everybody wanted to vote, even if they qualified for it. And in fact, during the women's suffrage movement, 76% of women did not want the vote. You know, they just, they didn't. And uh, their argument was like, I don't, why the hell would I want to vote? I don't want to die in a fire. Like, no, thank you. You know, like me and my husband talk about this and we vote as a household. That was actually you know, what, what happened, obviously the guy could do whatever the hell he wanted, but that was in a lot of places. That's what it was. It was a, it was a household decision. Um, not everyone has that relationship, but whatever women, you know, as a majority of people did not want the responsibilities that came with the, 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 the privilege. And so in order to overcome that, they just said, okay, well, we'll get rid of the responsibilities and everyone can just vote and you don't have to actually have the privilege. I think that was a mistake. Not, not giving women the vote, but not getting rid of the, of the, the responsibilities. I think that, that you need to have skin in the game. You know, yeah. why are you voting on whether or not we should go to war if you're not eligible, if you're not going to get drafted? You know, if you're just going to no, let's just send these assholes to war. Well, before you couldn't do that, you know, you had to, you, know, you were basically voting to send yourself to war. You know, so it, it made a different, it, it, there's a difference there. And, you know, and so, having skin in the game makes a big difference on your decision-making process. And it actually makes the world a better place, honestly. Yeah, indeed. And uh, some question that I was not sure that I should bring up, but I think it is more fitting because you also talked about Keynesians and the kind of criticisms that you bring up um, make me more certain that uh, we can also discuss this. Um, are you interested in Bitcoin and have, uh, have you gone uh, down that rabbit hole? I, I, I think so. I, 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 you know, I think it's interesting. It's very volatile. Um, I think it's an interesting concept to have this sort of tied outside of, yeah. of you know, out of the different markets and government uh, over, overreach, I should say, as opposed to oversight. Um, so it's nice. It's also interesting because it's, you know, it is a finite resource, right? There's what was yeah. it, like 22 billion of these things and that's it. And there will, there will never be more. Yeah. yeah. Whatever it is, it, you know, it's, it's like this, like that, that is how many there are and there will never be any more. So this is a finite commodity, even though it's only a theoretical commodity because it doesn't actually exist, you know, it's a digital currency. There's no actual tangible, uh, you know, there's no actual tangible good, but you know, it's, it's interesting from that standpoint, I've sort of dabbled in that, but I haven't really jumped head first into it. I, at the beginning of this, like when I was in medical school, I had a friend of mine talk to me about Bitcoin. And that, and that was when it was like, you know, you, people are using it for like black market, uh, deals and they have that. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
it was at that time, it was the most stable currency in the world. And, um, and that's because it was, it was used, you know, uh, you know, in, in, in these manners, but you know, now it's obscenely volatile. Obviously it's the opposite of what it used to be, but at that point it was the most, it was the most, um, stable currency. So while all these other currencies were inflating and, and so forth, this just, just, just stayed the same. And so as, as the dollar inflated and the Euro inflated, this just stayed the same. So it got a little more valuable, a little more valuable, sort of like gold, you know, and, it was like $6 a coin at that time. And I remember thinking at the time, I was like, well, maybe I'll just like throw 2000, you know, two grand into it and just see what happens, you know? And, um, you know, two grand could have bought, I think it was something like, I figured out was like 180 some coins. And, um, and at the time you had to go on the dark internet to buy these things. It was like, it was very shady and you had to know how to do it or someone was just going to rip all the information off your computer and just like, just rob you blind. And so, it was, it wasn't something I always feel felt comfortable doing. And so this guy knew how to do it. And I was like, Oh, well, the next time I hang out with him, I'll just sort of, I'll, I'll sort of ask him. And then I just sort of never got around to asking him again. And I just never did it. And obviously, you know, the rest is history, but yeah, I almost had a, almost uh, bought in for like 180 coins or something like that. That would have been awesome. But um, you know, at the moment it's, I, I do have some uh, investments in that, um, but it's quite volatile. And so it's, you know, I, I'm, not as uh, interested. I don't watch it as closely and it's not something that um, I think I'm going to, well, I'll take a look at it, but you know, it's, it's not something that and we'll see what happens. Like if it has a, it has a big dip, it is sort of dipping now, you know, I might, I might, uh, you know, buy in at that point, but um you know, we'll, we'll see. What about yourself? Are you into, mm -hmm. into all that? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, um, I am still in, in the rabbit hole and I'm going and getting deeper and deeper. And, um, the beautiful thing about the Bitcoin community is that it is just not the price. It is also the community and the books that, the, and that we read and the kind of ideas we converge on again. So many of the Bitcoiners are carnivores, weight oh, yeah. Nice. yeah. And, um, uh, Almost, uh, I have seen no, um, almost no Bitcoiner. And there are some, a few exceptions that come to mind that uh, they didn't get the mandatory um, the intervention. Uh, mm, yeah. And yeah, so uh, they are all critical of um, governmental decisions and centralized decisions. And uh, the community is beautiful. And as to uh, as for volatility, the volatility is going to be uh, a feature of it. Uh, as for it is, it just has a kind of only one percent of the population uses Bitcoin, so it is very small. And we are all early, uh, no matter how big the price is, how huge the price is, it is going to be a feature of the price for maybe decades into the future uh, until uh, until it gets established and more um, per percentage of the population knows about it. And the best strategy to go about it is, to, yeah, when it is uh, low, instead of just sell, uh, panic selling, to buy even more so that, and every four years, because first it is scarce and every four years there's a, there's a having cycle. So the miners get less reward for the blocks they mine. So there will be less amount available every four, uh, four years. Uh, so for four years, it is fixed. After almost four years, it changes and it becomes uh, half the amount that it used to be. So four years passes, more people get to know it. And at the same time, uh, not at the same time, but at, at a certain point, at the end of that four year, suddenly uh, the, the reward drops to half. So more people know it, know about it, but instead of the production going up, it actually goes low. Mm. So there's a surge in price every four years because of that, which is called NGU number go up technology. So every four years, the price is going to oscillate in a certain range. The next four years, mm. it is going to be volatile, but uh, in a higher step, in a higher, oh, higher range, yeah. And it is yeah. going to be with us until it is completely 
not necessarily completely. Some some people imagine a hyper Bitcoinized world in which Bitcoin is the only currency and the only unit. Maybe even before that, we see some sort of um, stabilization of the price and less volatility. That yeah, could be. And when and when people actually start you know using the currency as a currency more, then I think that will stabilize it a lot as well. You know, at, at the moment it's it's really just an investment. You know, people are sort of buying and trading it like stocks, but it used to actually be a currency that people use to, you know, buy drugs and, and, you know, kill people. And so, you know, that was, you know, that was, that was actually, you know, a currency and that was how it was used. You'd buy this currency so that you could get some things done on the black market. And that's why it was a very stable currency. I would imagine once that, you know, I mean, more things are, are accepting Bitcoin now as well. And, you know, I think Tesla accept Bitcoin. Um, but then they said that it is bad for the environment. Suddenly, uh, Elon Musk had that moment of realization. Oh, it is bad for the environment. And then he started bashing Bitcoin's it. Bad the, Bitcoin's <laughs> bad for the environment? Yeah. Bitcoin yeah, that doesn't was exist. Why, why is Bitcoin bad for the environment? It doesn't exist in the environment. <laughs> uh, well, they say that its mining is, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah uh, consumes a lot of energy and uh, we are bad people and we shouldn't be using energy because that's going to harm the environment. Obviously. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Coming from a car producer. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. and his cars are also like veganism. And the fact that you don't see the blood on your plate, you think that yeah. no animal yeah. was killed for it, but you don't see any fossil yeah. fuel in your car and you think that your car is green. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all these things are running on coal power and uh, natural mm -hmm. gas. We have by, them by thanks large. To you know, unless you're in France, where eighty percent of the grid is 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 nuclear. But you know, everyone you know hates nuclear here as well. So you know, there you go. That's the cleanest energy and the safe, cleanest and safest energy in the world. They don't uh, mm -hmm. they don't tell you that. Yeah, yeah, especially with respect to safety. And yeah, actually, with respect to cleanliness, maybe and productivity of. Uh, we could argue that uh, nuclear energy is much way more productive but mm -hmm. well yeah it has those shortcomings those disadvantages that it is not as safe as coal it is not as uh, clean as coal or gas yeah no yeah so so thomas Sowell writes about nuclear power as well and actually shows you know very very mathematically how nuclear is the cleanest and safest energy per kilowatt okay. hour yeah, okay. or per, per, per kilowatt. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, think about how much energy this is producing. It's just just dumping out energy, mm -hmm. and so you know it's um, you know and and you know think of like Three Mile Island in America. You know they just made a movie about how oh my gosh this big disaster and you know yeah it was, it was very scary. No one died from that disaster. Mm -hmm. Two people died in car accidents fleeing away from Three Mile Island. No one actually died from the 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 reactor. Uh, issues no one mm -hmm. so you know it's not actually uh, everything that we, we've been told it is you know france has been on a almost completely nuclear grid for decades you know i, I think eight something like 80 percent of their grid is nuclear they have like the cheapest energy it's certainly in europe possibly the world and then you contrast that with germany that are just so anti-nuclear so anti-coal uh, there's all these uh, renewable uh, things and their, their energy prices are astronomical. And so now they have a new category of poverty called, you know, energy poverty. So these people just can't afford, they, they go broke just trying to heat their homes through the winter, you know? Yeah. So yeah, not great. So again, thinking past stage one, oh, we want to get rid of nuclear because, oh, nuclear is bad. Okay. What are you going to replace it with? You know, what are you going to replace the coal? You going to replace with coal? No, 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 we don't want that. It's bad for the environment. Okay, and what are you going to replace it with? Okay, and then what happens? And then what happens? And then what happens? And you know, if you follow that out, you find out like, oh yeah, we've actually made our 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 people you know uh, beggared from the cost of electricity and power to heat their homes and and uh, and and support their families. People are dying of exposure and cold a lot more often. You know, so there's actually you know you can calculate these things. In, in human lives. So there's a, there's a book, another book, great book of Thomas Sowell's called um, Quest for Cosmic Justice, great book. And he talks about nu uh, nuclear energy and that. 
And, you know, he talks about like, you know, and, he, and there's a very, very funny uh, and, and great talk that he does, you know, sort of at a book conference for that book. And it's on YouTube. You can look it up, you know, Thomas Sowell, Quest for Cosmic Justice. We're talking about this and he talks about like, you know, it's like, you know, people ask a question, you know, is nuclear power safe? And the answer is no, because if it were, it would be the only safe thing on earth, you know, but, you know, there's relative uh, amounts of safe. So he said that living, I think it was, I forget the exact numbers, living within a five mile radius of a nuclear reactor for 20 years carries the same risk of death as 30, driving for 30 minutes on the freeway or spending six minutes in a canoe, you know? So like, you know, and so he was saying, he's just like, so I'm just thinking of all these, you know, uh, you know, nuclear energy uh, um, protesters sitting in their canoes, you know, talking about, you know, how dangerous nuclear energy is when in fact you just go into a canoe and have you been in a canoe before? No, I've been in a canoe. It's, uh, you know, there's just, little boats, right? I didn't die, but I spent more than six minutes in it. Six minutes in a canoe has the same risk of death as living within five miles of a nuclear reactor for 20 years. Okay. It's safe. It is bloody safe. And the amount of energy that it kicks out is in, in insane. Yeah. Yeah. And so and it's clean, you know? So yeah, you, do you have nuclear waste? Yeah. And we know how to do it. We do, uh, you know, process it, you know? Yeah. You don't like, you know, cut corners and, you know, dump it in a river or so, or in a lake or something like that. No, you, you take care of it, but we know how to take care of it. We know what to do with it. And so, you know, that's, and that, and that can be regulated and it should be, you know, you need to make sure these people are, do, are, are disposing of these things properly. Absolutely. But the energy itself is extremely safe, uh, you know, per kilowatt, you know, and it's, it's uh, and, and efficient and green, very green. Like this is, this is actually like, this gets rid of all pollution uh, from the energy side of things because we can absolutely run the entire grid off nuclear energy easily, easily. And, um, and then, you know, have all the electric cars that you want at that point. Yeah. 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 We can't even, you don't even have to, and develop batteries maybe you can develop roads based on i mean uh, yeah pass yeah, wires they, so that they, the cars are connected to that and they can work reliably all the time or just little you know fission engines in your car you know you just have a little speck of uranium in there and you just and you just go for you know 100 years you know uh, that and, looks like uh, science fiction but maybe that also comes to uh yeah, it could uh, be. Yeah. yeah okay. Like, um, yeah, I think that was like, like back to the future. Like, that thing ran on like, it's like, a, you know, some fusion reactor or something like that in his uh, car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, at, at the end, when he came down, he flew down. He's just like throwing banana peels and things like that. And like, that's what it was. But, um, but uh, yeah. So um, it is, is a very safe source of energy and very very clean so and that's one of the things you know thomas souls he just shows he just shows these are the numbers this is this these are the hard facts about this and you know and that's that's one of the things he, he always asks like three questions uh that, he, that of these of the people that uh, are, are sort of you know saying these these silly ideas you know and one of them is you know what hard evidence do you have to support that you know like you know, you're just what are you basing this on Okay. Okay. That's not hard evidence. What hard evidence do you have to support that? You know, and you know, at what cost, right? Because, you know, you, you go to Germany and you say, well, we need to get rid of nuclear. We don't like it. And we want to get rid of coal because it's dirty for the environment. Okay. At what cost? Because the alternatives end up screwing over millions, tens of millions of people yeah. and, cause, and causing death as a result you know so that's a cost so at what cost right um and then oh what was the other one um hard evidence you have at what cost and oh shit i forget the last one damn it um anyway i forget but anyway it's um people can look that up i'm really killing hating that i can't remember that right now what cost uh, what hard evidence you have I'm going to, I'm going to remember this exactly when this finishes up and I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> yeah. Maybe comparing its efficiency to other sources. Maybe I'm going to look it up. 
Oh, okay, sure. You say something. I'm gonna you you talk for a second. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna look yeah, this yeah, up. yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I think these people have problem as one of the uh, critics of uh, these environmental movements said put it. He said that they are against everything that works. So if nuclear works, they are against it. But then if they want to go back, it is going to be fossil fuel, and that's certainly bad. But that that yeah. works, and they are against that too. So they are definitely against things that work. Did you manage to yeah. find it? Find it? Yes, yeah, so I found it. Yeah. So the, the third question is uh, compared to what? You know? oh, compared to what? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's compared to what? You know. Mm -hmm. So it's just like. Yeah. You know, it's just like, oh no, 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 no. This is a much better policy. Okay, compared to what? You know, this is working better. Compared to what? You know, and so you you have to have something to compare something to. You know, and uh, to just see where it lays out relatively. Um, yeah, so, so the thing with, with, with fossil fuels though, um, sure, you can have things that, are, that cause pollution and that's, that's a very different thing. But what people talk about mostly with, with fossil fuels is the, the carbon dioxide that it puts off, yeah. okay? Are we, are we actually sure that that's a bad thing? What, what do plants breathe? I'm pretty sure it's carbon dioxide. Really love it. Yeah, yeah. And, and what are we made out of? We are carbon-based life forms almost all life on earth, there are actually other forms of, of life uh, besides carbon-based life, but the vast majority of life on earth are carbon-based life forms. So every, all the carbon that's sequestered in coal and oil is potential life that cannot exist because it's trapped and sequestered in this, mm -hmm. in this form. And so what do we see when, since the industrial revolution, we started putting out more CO2, we've had more plants grow and we've had more an animals live because you know, the biomass around the world has actually increased, okay? That's a good thing for the environment. That is the environment. So you know, people are talking about how like, oh, this is so bad for the environment, like, but the trees, there's more trees and, 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 and plants and crops go grow quicker. And this is actually helping world hunger because you can grow more things more quickly, like a greenhouse, you know? And, and they're saying, no, 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 it's bad for the environment. Like, you know, according to who, you know, what hard evidence do you have compared to what is this bad for the environment compared to what, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, at what cost, you know, because you're getting rid of fossil fuels. You look at India and China, they're saying they're, they're you know, the Paris Climate Accord, they're like, oh, yeah, we need to cut our fossil fuels. And they're like, yeah, no, you know, that that would absolutely you know, we're trying to develop and get this country going, that would completely screw us. You know, we can't just, you know, that that's a, you know, you know, they talk, talk about like, you know, white people problems, you know, it's just like, you know, it's just like, yeah, you, you can worry about that on your own time, but you know, we need to, we're actually trying to, you know, keep people uh, from starving to death mm -hmm. and from freezing to death. And, you know, so we, we actually do need, you know, uh, uh, clean efficient or cheap, efficient sources of energy. We can't just go to these expensive, uh, you know, models where, you know, wind farms and solar farms, which are wrought with problems and very inefficient. And, you know, just don't, you know, don't pay the bills, you know, frankly. And so, yeah, you can, you can afford to play those games in a wealthy country, but you can't actually do that in a developing nation where, you know, you know, life and death hang in the balance. So, you know, even in Germany, very, very wealthy country, people are dying as a result of these mm -hmm. dumb energy decisions that they have made. And I will say they are dumb because they are dumb. They've seen the results of these things and they are bad. And yet they are continuing to push like any, any bad government program. The yeah. only reason it failed is because we didn't do enough of it. Enough of it. You know? well, we should double down on that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so we should, we should have done it twice as hard. Then it will work. And it's just like, okay, you know, but again, they don't pay any price for being wrong. And so it really doesn't matter to them. They're just trying to get reelected. They're just trying to, you know, you know, line their own pockets usually you know there's always some sort of incentive there and uh, and if you suffer they they really don't care they just care about their own pockets and they have uh, access to the resources and they themselves distribute the resources so they give it to themselves and to their friends and they don't suffer any consequences oh, uh, i'm really glad that we could cover um so many diverse areas it was uh, great talking to you and i want to be respectful of your time though i really don't get tired of uh, yeah. talking to you listening to you 
I hope that in the near future we can get the chance to see uh, each other in person and we can yeah, yeah record another That'd podcast awesome, and to do and uh, yeah and uh, hope to have you for round three and more and counting so, in the future. Sounds good, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Have You're a good welcome. day. Thank you for having me. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Round the Fire. If you are watching this video on YouTube, please give it a like and hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave the five star review. It would cost you nothing but help me a great deal, especially if you do so on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you feel particularly generous, consider supporting me via Patreon, PayPal or Bitcoin.